Chapter Seventeen of the Actress in High Life: An Episode in Winter Quarters by Sue Pettigrew Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen. Who cannot be crushed with a plot? From all is well that ends well. Sir Rowland Hill had sent Lil off to the southward to ascertain the strength and condition of the reserve of Spanish troops moving up from Andalusia. One might think that these things would be better learned from the official reports of the Conde de Bispal and the officers under him. But from the Prince of Parma's day to this, Spanish officers in reporting the number and condition of their commands have made it a rule to state what they ought to be, not what they are, leaving all deficiencies to be found out on the day of the battle. Sir Rowland, knowing this, now made use of Lille, whose knowledge of the Spanish language and character, and his acquaintance with many officers of rank, enabled him to ascertain the truth without betraying the object of his mission, or giving offence to these proud and jealous allies. Ten days had gone by when he again rode into Elvis, and, in spite of the secrecy aimed at in military councils, many symptoms indicated that the campaign was about to open. It was high time for the brigade to leave this part of the country. The soldiers were disgusted with the sluggish people around them, keen and active only in their efforts to make money out of their protectors. The Portuguese were exasperated at the insolence of their allies, their frequent depredations and occasional acts of violence, many of which went unpunished, for the English officers, always professing the utmost readiness to punish the offences of their men, were singularly scrupulous and exacting as to the conclusiveness of the proofs of guilt. Lord Strathern's lax discipline may have aggravated, but had not caused the evil which was felt throughout Portugal. The Regency, while proving itself unable to govern the country, or reform a single abuse, had shown its ability to harass their allies and embarrass the general charged with the conduct of the war. A narrow jealousy had long ruled their conduct, and the spirit of captious discontent had now reached the inferior magistracy, who endeavored to excite the people against the military generally. Complaints came in from all quarters, of outrages on the part of the troops, some too true, but many of them false or frivolous. And when Wellington ordered courts martial for the trial of the accused, the magistrates refused to attend as witnesses, because Portuguese custom rendered such attendance degrading, and by Portuguese law a magistrate's written testimony was efficient in courts martial. Wellington in vain assured them that English law would not suffer him to punish men on such testimony, in vain he pointed out the mischief which must infallibly overwhelm the country if the soldiers discovered that they might thus do evil with impunity. He offered to send, in each case, lists of Portuguese witnesses required that they might be summoned by the native authorities. But nothing could overcome the obstinacy of the magistrates. They answered that his method was insolent, and, with sullen malignity, continued to accumulate the charges against the troops, to refuse attendance in the courts, and to call the soldiers, their own as well as the British, licensed spoliators of the community. For a time the generous nature of the poor people resisted all these combined causes of discontent. Yet by degrees the affection for the British cooled, and Wellington expressed his fears that a civil war would commence between the Portuguese people on the one hand, and the troops of both nations on the other. Wherefore his activity to draw all military strength to a head, and make such an eruption into Spain as would establish a new base of operations beyond the power of such fatal dissensions. Throughout the war, this great captain's hardest tasks had been to conciliate the jealous, vainglorious Spaniard, to stimulate the laggard, suspicious Portuguese, to enlighten the invincible ignorance of Regency and Juntas, in order to draw out and combine the resources of both countries with the scanty means afforded him by his own blundering government. He was required to do great things with small means, without offending one title against the laws, customs, and prejudices of three dissimilar nations. He might toil, fret, and fume, wearing himself to the bone, but could never get rid of this task of making ropes out of sea-sand. So much as to the state of the country. Let us return to our story. Lil reached Elvis early in the day, and resolved to reward himself for his labors by paying a visit to Lady Mabel. Then, after a conference with Lord Strathern, to sit down and write his report to Sir Roland on the state of the Andalusian Reserve. He knew that Sir Roland looked for a precise and pithy statement, and Lil meant this to be a model for all such communications. But fate may mar the wisest plan. He found Lady Mabel and Mrs. Shortridge together, and soon perceived that the latter lady's head was full of an entertainment she was about to give. "'The commissary has warned me,' she said, "'that from henceforth he will be ever on the move 
that he must break up his household here and send off his heavy baggage to Lisbon. In this he very politely includes his wife. I am truly sorry to hear it, said Lil, but confess that first among a soldier's impedimenta must be reckoned his wife. I did not look for so blunt an assent to the commissary's opinion from you, said Mrs. Shortridge, somewhat nettled. However, I am to go, and as many of the good folks of Elvis have been as polite to me as they know how, I wish to show my sense of it in parting. I have invited all my Portuguese friends with a good sprinkling of redcoats to meet them. I have put myself to infinite trouble and no little expense, meaning to have a grand evening combining tortulia, concert, and ball. I would show these people something of society and life, then vanish from Elvis in a blaze of glory. Now, as the rarest treat that I could offer, I had promised my guests that they should hear Lady Mabel in all her glorious richness of voice. And now she is seized with a sudden fit of modesty, and protests against being exhibited before a motley crowd like an opera singer. Lady Mabel's reluctance was not feigned, and when Mrs. Shortridge called on Lil for assistance in overcoming it, he felt some scruples at lending his aid but her companion and friend was about to leave her. It was painful to refuse her a favor on which she plainly laid great stress. Friendship and flattery at length prevailed, and Lady Mabel promised to do her utmost to charm the ears of the natives, on condition that Lil should be at hand as her interpreter, and say to them for her a dozen polite and half as many witty things for every song she sang, in order that these foreigners might not mistake her for a mere singer. Lil pledged himself to be at her beck throughout the evening, and to furnish wit and politeness without stint. This obstacle overcome, Mrs. Shortridge was delighted, and talked gaily of her arrangements and anticipations for the appointed night. Lil, entering into her humor, busied himself in drawing out a program for Lady Mabel's performance, and after turning over all the music at hand, made a list of songs long enough to have cracked her voice forever. It was late when he suddenly remembered that he had occasion to see Lord Strathern, and he tore himself away to seek him. Lil found his lordship in the business room of his quarters, and quite at leisure, although seated by a table on which lay sundry papers in no business-like order. Most of them were dispatches, returns, and other military documents. But among them was a goodly pile of communications from the Juiz de Fora, of more than one neighboring Comarca, written in eloquent but denunciatory Portuguese, being, in truth, Philippix aimed at sundry individuals or parties belonging to his command. The old soldier had not treated them with absolute neglect. After having the first two or three duly translated to him, and making himself familiar with the tenor of this kind of document, he had prepared a concise form of reply, regretting that any of His Majesty's soldiers should be guilty of any act of violence, depredation, or impropriety in the country of their friends and allies, and proposing that the accusers should come forward and prove the charges before a court-martial according to British laws. A copy of this stereotyped answer, turned into good Portuguese, was always at hand to be dispatched in reply to each new complaint as soon as it reached headquarters. Thus the correspondence cost little trouble there, for Lord Strathern had an easy-going philosophy which, like an ambling pad, carried him smoothly over the rough and intricate path of diplomacy, policy, and military exigencies. He knew it was impossible to give perfect satisfaction to the Portuguese, and, unlike his commander, he eschewed all such attempts to make ropes out of sea-sand. Lille's entrance roused Lord Strathern from a pleasant reverie over his cigar. "'Why, Lille, are you back again? You certainly have the gift of appearing just when you are wanted. Is not that the case with a character called Mephistopheles?' "'Yes, my lord, but he is a devil,' said Lille dryly. "'I beg your pardon.' I did not mean to make an unsavory comparison. But here is another be a from Sir Roland awaiting you. Lil, taking the dispatch handed to him, broke the seal and read it deliberately, then said, Does Sir Roland think I keep an extra stud of horses to do the riding that properly belongs to his own staff? Why, where is he sending you now? To Badajoz, on an errand similar to that on which I went into Andalusia. To Badajoz, that is no distance at all, at least nothing to grumble at said Lord Strathern. You are growing lazy, Lil. Why, Mabel would ride that far after a rare flower. Just think you are chasing a fox who takes the high road and never doubles once between this and Badajoz. That would be a fox of a new breed, suggested Lil. I confess, said his lordship, I never started one of the kind. But Sir Roland's staff have their hands full just now. To lighten their labors I have had to furnish more than one officer for special duties. 
you surely would not have sir roland send an aide all the way from coria merely to see if those spanish fellows in badajoz are in a state to march without disbanding or without plundering the country as they move through it talking of marauding my lord said lille i wish the taste for that diversion was confined to our spanish friends it is becoming every day more necessary to check the excesses of our own people we cannot send out a party into the country around but on their return they are dogged at the heels by complaints and accusations when we march hence we shall leave a villainous name behind us oh we will never come back here again said lord strathern carelessly moreover two-thirds of these complaints are groundless and the rest grossly exaggerated the sacking of the farmer's house on the border needed no exaggeration said lil i tell you that was done by the spaniards exclaimed lord strathern yet worse cases than that have occurred and gone unpunished urged lil because they never could prove the charge and point out the culprits replied his lordship the country is full of rateros they commit the crimes and our fellows bear the blame that is often true but i have met with one little case in which the offenders can be pointed out well let me hear it said lord strathern leaning back in his chair as if compelled to listen but anxious to be rid of the subject i stopped for a while on my way back said lil at a little venda on this side of juramenia the people of the house were shy and sullen i had to ask many questions before i could induce them to speak freely but at length out came a charge against some of our people three nights ago five of our men had come to the house and calling for wine sat down to drink they soon became riotous and their conduct so insulting to the man's wife and daughters that they ran away to hide themselves when he required them to pay the reckoning and quit the house they promised most liberal payment and seizing bound him to a post in his own stable where they gave him fifty lashes with a leathern strap valuing the stripes at a vintem apiece the witty rascals said lord strathern i would like to repay them in their own coin moreover continued lil on the man's son making some resistance to the treatment of his father they bound the boy too and gave him a dozen vintems worth of the strap for pocket money the liberal rascals said lord strathern they deserve a handsome profit on their outlay but how do you know lil that this story is true there is no mistake about the flogging exclaimed lil they used the buckle end of the strap and i myself saw the marks some not yet scarred over that silent witness may prove a good deal i cannot call it tongueless said his lordship for i suppose the buckle had a tongue i can vouch for that by the mark it left behind said lil both father and son swore that they would know the fellows among a thousand but the man dare not come to elvis to search them out as the scamps promise faithfully to make sausage meat out of him should he venture near the town if the cowardly rascal will not come forward and lodge a complaint said lord strathern what the devil can we do we can bring him here and protect him said lil while he hunts out the culprits if necessary i will take him before my regiment and let him look every man in the face to see if he can identify the offenders in the ranks and so with other regiments what muster the whole brigade for such a poltroon to inspect them exclaimed lord strathern what are you dreaming of lil it would be offering a bounty for accusations against the men half these rascals would swear away a man's life for a crusado perhaps so my lord but by cross questions and examining them apart the truth may be wrung from even lying witnesses impossible with these people the truth is not in them come lil no one knows better than you who are so much in sir roland's counsels that we are on the point of moving from this part of the country the little disorders that have occurred here can be followed by no ill consequences we carry the worst consequences with us said lil pertinaciously little disorders my lord the peasantry round elvis do not talk of them so they say that their property is plundered their women insulted and themselves at constant risk in life and limb what do the rascals talk of us in that way even while we are protecting them exclaimed lord strathern springing from his chair we have spent more money among them than their beggarly country is worth in fee simple and they are no more thankful than if we had occupied it as enemies i wish they had among them again for a few weeks that one-handed loison with his cut-throat bands or pious you know who loved church plates so well it is bad enough to be robbed by their enemies they say suggested lil but they did not expect it from their friends 
Pooh, said Lord Strathern. The Portuguese, of all people, ought to know what real military license is. The French taught them that. As for our fellows, what if they do at times drink a little more wine than they pay for, or even take a lamb or kid from the flocks they protect, or kiss a wench before she has consented? Is that anything to make a hubbub about? The lads should be paid for drinking their muddy vino verde, and as for the girls, all the trouble comes of their ignorance of our tongue, so that they have to be talked to by signs. You must be jesting, my lord. To overlook small offences is to license greater. I license none. I punish whatever is clearly proved, but will not play grand inquisitor and hunt out every little peccadillo. With your notions, Lil, you would bring the men to confession every morning and make the service worse than purgatory. Must I answer for it if a girl squeaks out half in jest and half in earnest? Lil was provoked to see that Lord Strathern was laughing at him and said earnestly, You cannot have forgotten, my lord, the state of the army at the end of the campaign. Little has yet been done to bring this brigade up to the mark, and little will be achieved by it in the coming campaign in its present state. Now is the time to check the licentious spirit by making some severe examples. I will do no such thing, said Lord Strathern coolly. The occasion does not call for it. We will be in the field shortly and want all the bayonets we can muster. The brigade is too weak to spare men from the ranks to put into irons. I did not suppose, said Lil, that the warning my Lord Wellington gave us not long since would be so soon forgotten. Lil alluded to the circular letter Wellington had addressed to his subordinates at the end of the campaign, in which he had politely dubbed half of his officers idlers, whose habitual neglect of duty suffered their commands to run into ruffianism. Perhaps their commander was suffering under a fit of indigestion when he wrote it. It certainly caused a general heart-burning among his officers. Lord Strathern, among others, had found it hard to digest, and now angrily denounced it unjust. "'Well, my lord,' said Lille, with more zeal than discretion. By the end of the campaign our men may be in a state to be improved by a touch of discipline from Julian Sanchez or Carlos de Spagna, unless they reject them as too much like banditti. "'And I am captain of the banditti!' exclaimed Lord Strathern in a sudden rage. "'As you do not yet command the brigade, let me beg you, sir, to go and look after your own people.' and keep them up to the mark lest they become banditti. I always obey orders, my lord, said Lil with suddenly assumed composure. I will go and look after my own regiment and let the rest of the brigade march. Where, sir? thundered Lord Strathern. Their own road, Lil answered, and bowed himself out of the room. He walked sedately through the long corridor that led to the entrance of this monastic house, then yielding to some violent impulse sprang into his saddle and plunging his spurs into his horse's flanks dashed out of the court and through the olive grounds at a killing pace his astonished groom stared at him for a moment then followed with emulous speed as lil turned suddenly into the high road a voice called out don't ride me down i'm no frenchman and he saw colonel bradshaw quickly but coolly press his ambling cob close to the hedge to avoid his charge "'You seem to be in a hurry, Lil. Hello! Here is another,' said the colonel, giving his horse another dexterous turn to shun the onset of the groom. "'What news has come? Or have you joined the dragoons? Or are you merely running a race with your man here?' "'Neither, sir,' said Lil, who had pulled up and turned to speak to his comrade. His flashing eye and excited manner, his thoroughbred steed, chafing on the bit and pawing the ground, were in striking contrast with the unruffled Bradshaw on his sleek cob, whose temper was as smooth as his coat. "'The fact is,' said Lil, in what was meant for an explanatory tone, "'I have just had a serious conversation with Lord Strathern, "'Which grew quite animated before it came to an end,' interjected Bradshaw coolly, "'in which I took the liberty of expressing my opinion.' continued Lil. "'Rather strongly on the subject of discipline, military license, and the articles of war,' interjected Bradshaw again. "'You are happy in your surmises, sir,' said Lil stiffly, for Bradshaw's imperturbable manner chafed him much in his present mood. "'Surmises, my dear fellow, do I not know your opinions and my lord's? You believe the rules and regulations were made to be enforced ad literam, and he thinks they are to be hung up in terrorem.' My lord, 
added Bradshaw in a calm, judicial tone, is the more mistaken of the two. Since so far you agree with me, said Lil, would it not be well for you to remind his lordship that it is time to enforce some of the rules and regulations for the government of his majesty's troops, if he would have his brigade consist of soldiers and not of robbers? It is very desirable to keep up the distinction between the two professions, said Bradshaw. One has a strong tendency to slide into the other. Pray tell me what arguments you have been using with my lord. Lil, with an effort at calmness, repeated the substance of the late conversation, much to Bradshaw's amusement for in him a genuine love of mischief rivaled his epicurean taste. "'On one point my lord had the advantage of you,' said Bradshaw. "'It is his privilege to bid you look after your regiment, not yours to bid him look after his brigade.' "'True,' said Lil bitterly. "'But as you, though my senior, are not my commander, I trust there is no insubordination in my telling you that the brigade is left to look after itself, and is going to the devil as fast as it can.' "'As individuals,' said Bradshaw, "'that is the probable destination of most of us. "'We will have to get Julian Sanchez or the Impesonado "'or some other guerrilla chief to undertake its reformation,' "'continued Lil in great heat. "'I forgot to suggest to my lord that before we march away "'we ought to levy a contribution as a bounty "'for the blessings we bestow on the neighborhood in leaving it.' "'A capital idea,' said Bradshaw, "'but by no means original. "'The French always do so when they change their cantonments.' That is, if there be anything left in the country around. If our hands were not tied, we might yet learn some clever arts from Monsieur. Juno's system was to drive up all the farm cattle of the neighborhood just before he marched off, then allow them to be redeemed at a low cash price. He found it a capital way to extract the last hidden crusado. You have mastered the enemy's system thoroughly, said Lil with a sneer. But as our hands are tied, we cannot imitate them. Perhaps it would better become our position in the brigade for you to try and rouse his lordship to the necessity of checking the license that is growing daily. I would gladly do so, said Bradshaw, but being no Oxford logician, have not your irresistible power of convincing him. You have handled the matter so fully and ably that I need only repeat faithfully every word you have said. You may depend on me for that. And, turning his horse, he rode gently off toward headquarters, while Lil galloped up the hill to Elvis. Bradshaw found Lord Strathern in as great a rage as the comrade he had just parted with, so he amused himself with drawing out from his lordship a recital of their late conversation, which he repaid with a sketch of Lil's roadside conference with himself. The old soldier was only the more provoked on finding that, freely as Lil had spoken, he could hardly charge him with insubordination or twist his hot arguments into a personal insult. Soothing and chafing him by turns, Bradshaw did not permit the subject to drop until they were interrupted by a courier with dispatches. "'What is all this, post upon post? There must be something in the wind,' said my lord, as he broke the seal which was Sir Roland Hill's. "'Our pleasant winter here is over,' said Bradshaw with a sigh. We will be moving shortly, and then hot marches and cold meals, sour wine in bad quarters, or no quarters at all, will be the order of the day. I trust we shall move through a more plentiful country than we did last year. It has not quite come to that yet, said Lord Strathern. Here is an order for me to meet Sir Roland at Alcantara at ten the day after tomorrow. I am to take you and Conway with me, for he has special instructions for you both. "'and here is an order for that modest fellow Lil "'to attend and report the state of the Andalusian Reserve. "'I expect Conway to dinner. "'You had better stay and meet him.' "'In due time Major Conway appeared "'and dinner was announced. "'Mrs. Shortridge had gone home "'so that only two guests sat down "'with Lady Mabel and her father. "'No man made himself more agreeable "'in his own house and at his own table "'than Lord Strathern usually did, "'for hospitality was with him "'an article of religion.' but to-day my lord was not in a religious frame of mind. He was moody and silent, or growled at his servants, and gave short answers to his guests, so that Major Conway, after sundry attempts to engage him in conversation, gave it up, and joined Bradshaw in his efforts to entertain Lady Mabel. At length the cloth was removed, the servants withdrew, and the gentlemen sat over their wine. Yet Lady Mabel, not trained to a nice observance of little conventionalities, lingered there, watching her father's moody brow. "'So Lil has got back,' said Major Conway. "'The impudent coxcomb!' exclaimed Lord Strathern. Conway started, 
but Lady Mabel started as if a snake had bitten her. She said nothing, however. Perhaps she could not had she tried. But Conway exclaimed, "'My lord, perhaps I did not hear you rightly.' "'You did, Major Conway. I say that Lil is an impudent coxcomb. The most presumptuous fellow I know. I will find or make an occasion to give him a lesson he much needs.' "'Why, my lord, what has Lil done?' asked the major. "'Done?' said Lord Strathern angrily. "'He has said a great deal more than I will tolerate.' And having broached the subject, he told the story of Lil's interview with himself, and his remarks to Bradshaw, pronouncing his whole conduct presumptuous and impertinent. Losing his temper more and more, he exclaimed, "'Sir Roland's absurd partiality has spoiled the fellow utterly.' "'Sir Roland must not bear all the blame,' said Bradshaw, interposing, then added slyly, "'No wonder Lil's head is turned, considering who all have helped to spoil him.' "'So they have, and you have spoiled him more than any one else,' exclaimed Lord Strathern, turning suddenly on Lady Mabel. "'I hear of nobody but Colonel Lil. This colonel of yours has been growing more and more intolerable.' "'My colonel, Papa. I assure you I lay no claim to him,' said Lady Mabel, hastily disclaiming all interest in poor Lil. "'Why do you have him so much about you, then, and quote him so often?' "'Why, my lord,' said Bradshaw, again interposing, Lady Mabel cannot but see and hear much of Lil while she sees so much of Mrs. Shortridge, their mutual friend. Lady Mabel was truly thankful for this diversion. It gave her one moment to think, and that was enough. In her father's present mood, Lil could not escape gross insult at their next meeting. She felt that the best way to mollify his anger was to take up his quarrel vigorously herself. So, warming herself into a fit of indignation becoming the occasion, she exclaimed, it is no fault of mine that I see so much of Colonel Lil. Why do you make him so often your guest? As Colonel Bradshaw says, I have no fit companion here but Mrs. Shortridge, and he is often with her. As to his presumption, it is not so new to me as you suppose. I have often laughed at him for his vanity in thinking that nobody can do anything as well as himself. I have had to check him before this for presuming to find fault with your management of the brigade but did not imagine he would have the impertinence to insinuate to your face that he could command it better than you do. "'By Jove!' exclaimed Lord Strathern. "'Indirectly he as good as told me so.' "'So it seems,' said Lady Mabel indignantly. "'I am your daughter and resent such boyish impertinence more even than you do. I will take the earliest opportunity to express to him my opinion on that point most emphatically.' Bradshaw was discreetly silent, drinking in every word. He did not actually hate Lil. He liked Lady Mabel well. But he loved the mischief of brewing and watched her game, for he saw plainly that she was playing one. Conway sat wondering what all this would lead to, anxious yet afraid to say a word in extenuation of poor Lil's offences. "'By the by,' exclaimed Lady Mabel, "'I have promised Mrs. Shortridge my utmost aid in entertaining her guests tomorrow night.' and the better to enable me to give it colonel lil is pledged to be in constant attendance as my interpreter i must write at once and let him know that i shall dispense with his services write to the fellow at once growled lord strathern and do not let him misunderstand the tenor of your note but he has gone to badajoz said bradshaw still if he has an appointment with you lady mabel he will assuredly be back in time but my lord said major conway you have an order for him to attend Sir Roland at Alcantara the morning after, so that he would have to give up the pleasure of waiting on Lady Mabel at Mrs. Shortridge's, even though she did not discard him in this summary manner. Then Mabel shall summon him to attend her according to promise, in spite of Sir Roland's order, thundered Lord Strathern, with all the perverseness of an angry man. But suppose he pleads Sir Roland's order in excuse, urged Conway. It shall not serve him. "'Mabel shall treat it as a fresh piece of impertinence "'and cut him for ever. "'Suppose he attends Lady Mabel and neglects Sir Roland. "'Then Sir Roland shall know how lightly he holds his orders.' "'That is being very hard upon Lil,' said Conway. "'Not as hard as he deserves,' said Lord Strathern with a bitter laugh. "'It is probably very important,' urged Conway, "'that Sir Roland should know at once the real state of this Andalusian reserve.' "'Much may depend upon it.' "'Tut!' said Lord Strathern contemptuously. "'What matters Lil's being able to tell him "'whether or not they look like soldiers? 
if you had been long in spain you would have known that the fighting has to be done by us oh yes said bradshaw whatever they may do on parade the fighting always falls to our lot lady mabel had listened to this dialogue with intense interest and no little confusion of mind she was very angry with lil and that perhaps made her feel how important he had become to her she was not quite prepared to cut his acquaintance and turn her back on him forever and now thought she saw her way through the difficulty you are driving my friend lil to the wall said major conway i know him to be a gallant man but however painful the sacrifice may be to him i think he will feel compelled to waive his engagement with lady mabel and wait on sir roland hill let him if he dare said lady mabel with an emphatic stamp of her foot i applaud your spirit lady mabel said bradshaw mischievously it is lucky for lil that the stuarts of strathern are not now represented by a son as it is lil will have to make his submission with the best grace he can i trust lady mabel will accept it in some other shape than slighting sir roland's order said conway lil will not do that that and nothing else said lady mabel resolutely almost angrily i hold myself to be quite as good as sir roland and the first appointment was with me sir roland will have to yield precedence to you lady mabel said bradshaw if lil knows the penalty he will have to attend on you begging lady mabel's pardon said conway lil will do no such thing conway said lord strathern with a sneer this punctilious friend of yours is very exacting toward other people but i will bet you fifty guineas that he keeps sir roland waiting for news of a batch of ragamuffins not worth hearing about my funds are rather low just now said conway to hazard fifty guineas on a bet i thought you would not back him but in words said lord strathern in a contemptuous tone nay said conway stung by his manner i know that where duty is concerned lil is a punctilious man to obey every order to the letter and the second is a point of honour with him and i will risk my money upon him done said lord strathern and now mabel use your wits to keep the fellow here and make a fool of him and i will expose and laugh at him as he deserves at alcantara but this is a regular plot against poor lil objected conway plot or no plot it is understood that you give him no hint said lord strathern certainly not exclaimed bradshaw rubbing his hands together conway you must not blab i suppose i must not said conway with a very grave face chiefly for lil but partly for his fifty guineas but this is a serious matter it may be of vital importance for sir roland to know at once if the andalusian reserve the andalusian reserve said lord strathern interrupting him will never let themselves be food for powder lady mabel now slipped out of the room to hide her confusion and anxiety and major conway finding my lord not in a mood to please or be pleased soon took leave followed by bradshaw in high glee though he suppressed the outward signs of it until he had turned his back upon the hospitable mansion End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the actress in high life an episode in winter quarters by sue pettigrew bowen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen here on the clear cold esla's breezy side my hand amidst her ringlets wont to rove she preferred now the lock and now denied with all the baby playfulness of love here the false maid with many an artful tear made me each rising thought of doubt discover and vowed and wept till hope had ceased to fear ah me beguiling like a child her lover southey from the spanish lord strathern's anger was not unlike a thunderstorm violent and loud but not very lasting it had spent its worst fury last night but lady mabel still heard the occasional rumbling of the thunder in the morning while seated with her father at an unusually early breakfast for he had before him no short day's journey over the rough country between elvis and alcantara sleep may have dulled the edge of his anger against lil but he had not forgotten or forgiven him as he kissed his daughter before he mounted his horse for she had followed him into the court he said do not forget that fellow lil mabel keep him here and make a fool of him and i will expose and laugh at him to-morrow in alcantara 
Now Lady Mabel had forgotten neither Lille nor his offenses. She was indignant at his presumptuous censure of her father, as unjust and disrespectful to him, and showing too little consideration for herself. In short, it was, as Colonel Bradshaw had insinuated, an indignity to the whole house of Stuart of Strathern. It must be resented. Yet she could not resolve to turn her back upon him and discard him altogether, as she was pledged to do as one alternative. She thought it a far fitter punishment to compel him to keep his appointment with her and make Sir Roland wait, fretting and fuming over the intelligence he longed for and which Lille alone could give him. She reveled in the idea of making Lille turn his back on military duty to obey her behest. Quote, How she would make him fawn and beg and seek, and wait the season and observe the times, and spend his prodigal wit in bootless rhymes. End quote. But then Lil was so punctilious on points of duty, and Major Conway had been so confident that she could not detain him in Elvis, that she begun to doubt it herself and resolved to spare no pains to gain her end. So she at once sat down and penned an artful note, then calling for her fine footman dispatched him with it to Lil's quarters, after schooling him well that he was to give it to the colonel's own man, with strict injunctions to put it in his master's hand on his return, if possible, before his foot was out of the stirrup certainly before he got any other letter awaiting him. Meanwhile, Lil was zealously fulfilling his mission at Badajoz. He had made such good speed the evening before that though the sun had set on him in Elvis, some lingering rays of twilight still fell on the round Moorish tower of white marble on either hand as he entered the bridge-gate of Badajoz. No sooner had he alighted at the posada than he wrote a note and sent it to the governor of the place, saying that having just come back from Andalusia, whither he had been sent on an important mission by Sir Roland Hill, and not doubting that the Spanish dignitary would be glad of news from that province, he would wait on him at breakfast next morning. This done, and learning that many of the Spanish officers were to be found at another posada, he hastened thither, soon meeting acquaintances, and making more among them. He knew well how to approach the Spaniard, mingling the utmost consideration with his frank address, and taking pains to make himself agreeable, even to that puppy Don Alonso Melendez whom he found among them. Many of them were at cards and the dice were not idle. Lil soon found a place among the gamesters and took care to lose a few pieces to more than one of his new friends. A thing easily done, they being in high practice and he little skilled in these arts. Having thus made himself one of them, he, like a true Englishman, set to drinking, contrived to get about him some of the graver and less busy of the gentlemen present, and, while discussing with them the best wine the house afforded, he adroitly turned the conversation to the topics on which he sought information. He did not go to bed at a late hour without having learned much as to the garrison of Badajoz, and of the new precautions taken for the safety of this important fortress. Early in the morning, Lil called on the governor, and found him in his dressing-gown, just ready for his chocolate. The Don was well pleased to hear Lil's account of the force coming up from Andalusia, of his interviews with officers high in command in it, and his comments on the spirit, activity, and endurance of the Spanish soldier. This led to further conversation in which Lil, while sipping chocolate with the Spaniard, took occasion to abuse the French roundly which was agreeable enough to his host. But he quite won his heart by the unfeigned contempt and abhorrence he expressed for the Afrancesados. Lil soon found that, in spite of his unsoldierly undress, the Don was a sturdy old fellow, who chafed at being shut up in a garrison surrounded by defensive walls and moats. He longed to take the field and become the assailant. "'I trust we will all be in the field shortly,' said Lil, echoing his sentiment. "'But we have wily foes to deal with. All their great successes have been won by surprise, aided by traitors among us. They are now evidently anxious to anticipate us, and if we delay long there is no knowing where the first blow may fall. I wonder,' said he with a puzzled look, "'why they keep so large a force at Trujillo and have such strong detachments foraging on this side of the mountains of Toledo. A few marches may unite them near us.' "'Do you suppose that they are thinking of Badajoz?' asked the Spaniard, looking as if Lil had seized him by the shoulders and roughly waked him up. Marshal Soult has an eye this way and would give more than his little finger to have it again, said Lil, for nothing would cramp our movements more than the loss of it. They have now, indeed, little chance of success, we know, he added, bowing to the governor, but may think it worth trying. Their leaders think nothing of risking the loss of a thousand men or so on the slenderest chance of a great prize. The conscription fills up all these gaps. No doubt, no doubt, but we will watch the rascals closely, said the governor. I dare say, said Lil, laughing, 
you have a spy or two in trujillo besides the lynx-eyed keen-eared scouts you keep on the roads and in the villages around you we get intelligence we get intelligence said the spaniard evasively but as the french are now moving it will be well to bestir ourselves to find out what they are at these and other hints that lil threw out not as advice but inquiries and chance suggestions being mingled with deferential attention to all the spaniard had to say neither startled his vanity nor chafed his pride he was pleased with lil talked frankly to him and presented him ceremoniously to his officers who now began to wait upon him when lil was about to take his leave he urged him to return to dinner and charged a favorite officer to show lil everything he wished to see in badajos that he might be enabled to report the condition of this stronghold to sir roland hill i must communicate with sir roland so speedily said lil that i must be content with the pleasure of having breakfasted with your excellency and with marked respect he took leave of the governor and his suite having been treated in diplomatic phrase with distinguished consideration indeed had sir roland seen and heard him during his audience he would have patted him on the back and thanked his stars for giving him so able and adroit an ambassador were it possible to become wise by the wisdom of another badajos would have had a watchful governor prolonged watching is no easy task but lil knew that if the spaniard could be roused to a week of vigilance the urgent need of it would be over he spent an industrious morning making himself agreeable to his companion while inspecting the resources of the place and the day was well worn away when his guide and escort took leave of him at the posada his business here finished he wished to leave badajos at once and on looking for his groom found him ensconced in the kitchen providently dining on a rabbit stuffed with olives and draining a bottle of wine baptized val de peñas addressing the landlord's tawny daughter with a flattering air and smacking his lips approvingly after each mouthful whether solid or fluid while he abused both food and wine in emphatic english throwing in many back-handed compliments to the lady's beauty and she stood simpering by construing his words by his manner on seeing his master enter hastily tom who had laid in all the wine and most of the food set before him got up respectfully to receive his orders while with a full mouth he mumbled out prayer and provender hinder no man's journey you abridge the proverb in practice said lil leaving out the prayer to gain time to take care of the provender then sitting down at the table he took out a paper and began to note down what he had observed in badajos there is nothing very tempting here said he presently glancing his eye over tom's scanty leavings but a luncheon will not be amiss so i will take what i can find while you saddle the horses it was late in the day when lil left badajos but instead of posting back to elvis as he had come from it he rode slowly on sometimes lost in thought at times gazing on the scene around him many objects along the road brought vividly back to him the incidents of that pleasant excursion so lately taken in company with lady mabel here she had turned her horse aside for a moment to pluck some blossoms from this carob tree which stands alone on the sandy plain around it here on the bank of the cayo was the spot where she had pressed so close up to him for protection in the dark on the first alarm of danger before them there stood the old watch-tower which they had examined together with interest speculating on its history lost in bygone ages crossing the stream here further on were the prints of her horse's hoofs on the steep pebbly bank as she had turned suddenly from the road to ride up to the mysterious old ruin were these pleasant days over lil knew that lord strathern had taken violent perhaps lasting offence at his strictures and he himself was too indignant at the summary way in which his commander had cut short his protest and dismissed him and the subject for him to make any conciliatory advances knowing too lady mabel's devotion to her father and her tenacity where his character and dignity were concerned there was no saying how much she might resent lil's offence when it came to her knowledge he could hardly just now at least frequent headquarters on his former footing he was so much engrossed by these unpleasant thoughts that it was in vain officious tom several times rode up close upon him making his own horse curvet and caper hoping to attract his master's attention and remind him that he was loitering on the road long after his dinner hour lil went on at a foot-pace up the hill of elvis until from a neighbouring hedge a nightingale for whose ditty the hours of darkness were too short began his plaintive song many a time had lil paused to listen to such minstrelsy but now his ear or something else was out of tune Quote, except i be with sylvia in the night there is no music in the nightingale End quote. rousing himself he cantered through the gate and hastened to his quarters 
Now it was some time since L Isle's servants had picked up the notion that in no way could they please him half so well as by obeying the slightest hint from Lady Mabel. So his man came promptly out, armed with her note, and thrust it into his hand before he had left the saddle. Entering his quarters hastily, he broke it open and read it with infinite satisfaction. Lady Mabel sends her compliments to Colonel L Isle. She has a presentment that her pleasant sojourn in Elvis draws to its end. Like Mrs. Shortridge, she is ambitious to leave among her Portuguese friends the most favorable recollection of herself. So tonight she will spare no pains, but will dress, look, sing, and act her best, and be as agreeable as she can to the natives at Mrs. Shortridge's house. She relies confidently on Colonel Lille's attending her as interpreter, and saying a thousand witty and pleasant things in her name. This, too, may be her last opportunity of thanking him for the many, many delightful excursions enjoyed under his guidance and protection. She may never repeat, but can never forget them. This note relieved Lille of a load of anxiety. It was plain that Lawrence Strathern had gotten over his anger and meant to have no quarrel with him, or, more gratifying still, would not have the whole house of Strathern involved in it, and so had given no hint of it to his daughter. It was, too, the first note he had ever received from Lady Mabel, and sportive as its tone was in the beginning, there was something of feeling and even sadness in its close. Lil well knew, while Lady Mabel had only chosen to assume it, that the time for leaving Elvis was indeed at hand. Yet a few days and a few things were more uncertain than his again meeting Lady Mabel on this side of the grave. A few golden hours had yet to fleet by. Who would throw away a happiness because it is fleeting? Lil had sunk into a delightful reverie, anticipating the pleasures of the evening, when his man of method laid before him the despatch from his other correspondent, Sir Rowland Hill. He read it hastily and angrily threw it on the floor. He thought himself an ill-used man. Be in Alicantara by ten tomorrow. I will do no such thing. I have been in the saddle for weeks. My horses are worn out. He chose to forget a fresh horse in the stable. Up late last night and worried all day about affairs over which I have no control and fellows who will fail us at need. Sir Roland must wait till dinner time tomorrow for news of these dilatory Spaniards. If he has to deal much more with them, it will be a useful lesson to learn to wait. He now went to his chamber to dress in order to attend Lady Mabel. When he returned to his parlor, seeing Sir Roland's insulted despatch still lying on the floor, he condescended to pick it up and stow it away in his pocket with his notes on the state of the Andalusian Reserve and the garrison of Badajoz, and then rode off in the happiest mood to headquarters. But when he dismounted there, his conscience pricked him. An ambitious soldier, zealous in the cause for which he fought, he not long since would have felt one moment's forgetfulness or the slightest neglect of the service to be treason against his own nature. He now turned back from the door to bid the groom leave his own horse in Elvis and take the fresh horse on to the little town of Albuquerque and expect him at the posado there before the dawn of day. Having by this provision for riding post quieted the compunctious visitings of conscience, he entered the house. Lady Mabel kept him waiting some time purposely, for delay was now her policy. Soon, however, he heard her talking in the next room, and the abrupt and crabbed tones of the voice which answered her betrayed Moody in one of his objecting and protesting moods. Lady Mabel was giving sundry injunctions to an unwilling agent. At length the old Scotch grieve, like one of his own ill-conditioned steers, would neither lead nor drive for when she bid him to put the clock back an hour he flatly refused, calling it acting a lie as the wily Gibeonites did to Joshua. Or as Jacob and Rebecca did to blind old Isaac, Lady Mabel suggested, but even the example of the patriarch could not move him, and Lady Mabel had to make time move backward with her own hand. At length she entered the room radiant with beauty and with smiles, for Moody's obstinacy had not ruffled her in the least. She was so sorry to have kept Colonel Lill waiting, and so much afraid he would have to wait a while longer as the old Lisbon coach and the mules with their harness were not put together so speedily as the London turnout of a fashionable lady. I am to blame, she continued, for not having looked to it before, for Antonio Lobo, my impromptu postillion, is less skilled in the management of my vehicle than of the olive trees among which he has lived until he has taken the color of their ripe fruit. To fill up the time, she now asked Lil's opinion of her dress, seeing him eye it with some surprise. Turning gracefully about and showing it off to him from different points of view, she told him that, as a last compliment to her Elvis friends, she had for once adopted their costume. Improved upon it, rather, 
said Lille, for she had not closely followed the local costume where it did not please her. Then, running on from one lively topic to another, she amused Lille so successfully that he felt it to be an interruption when the footman came in to say that the coach was ready. After depositing her guitar in state on a pile of music on the front seat, Lille at length found himself beside Lady Mabel in this venerable vehicle, long used to bear a noble burden, having belonged to a Portuguese marquis, who, on the first approach of Juno's invading horde, had run off to Brazil, leaving his coach, his estate, his country, and perhaps his honor behind him. Slow and dignified as became its character was its progress up the hill of Elvis for one pair of the team of mules which had brought it from Lisbon had returned to their duty in the quartermaster's department and their comrades, left to their own unaided efforts, found the coach almost as hard to handle as a nine-pounder. But in the dove-like, billing and cooing humour in which Lil was, time flew on the wings of the carrier pigeon, and they arrived at Mrs. Shortridge's house too soon for him, though all the guests but themselves were there already. Two or three score of Portuguese, most of them ladies, and nearly as many English officers, filled the rooms. Some of these gentlemen looked surprised at seeing Lil, thinking he had already left Elvis. Lieutenant Goring, who was showing off his tall, lithe person and dragoon uniform to the best advantage, beside his short and sturdy friend Captain Hatton, seemed annoyed at Lil's presence, and Hatton shared his feelings. Lil stood in the way of their paying court to Lady Mabel, and Goring at least had reckoned on his absence. "'I had hoped,' said he, "'that we were rid of the colonel for once. He is an abominable monopolist.' He is so, said Hatton, for Lady Mabel's smiles belong to the brigade. And the light dragoons quartered with it, interjected Goring. But here he is, basking in the sunshine and keeping us shivering in the shade when he ought to be on the road to Alcantara. Sir Roland is expecting him. Major Conway seemed quite anxious that he should be there betimes in the morning and, doubtless, had some good reason for it. Why do you not give him a hint? asked Hatton. Perhaps he has forgotten it. He is your colonel, and the hint would come better from you. Thank you, said Hatton. But in our regiment it is contrary to the etiquette to hint to the colonel that he is neglecting his duty. But it seems, said Goring, that the rule does not apply to the brigade. The major tells me that Lil has freely censured my lord's remissness, and urged him to enforce more stringent discipline. How did my lord take it? Like a slap in the face, answered Goring. At least he treated it as a great piece of presumption, and Lil was thoroughly angered at the rough answer he got. Indeed, Conway thinks that there is nothing but ill blood between them. That does not look much like it, said Hatton, glancing at Lady Mabel with Lil at her elbow. Let us go and beat about the bushes. We may start something worth chasing. The two friends, looking like a greyhound and a bull terrier coupled together, proceeded to hunt and couple by thrusting themselves into the cluster of gentlemen around Lady Mabel. Hatton, with a little start of admiring surprise, praised the taste displayed in her dress, regretted her being so late in adopting it, it so became her. He looked round, appealing to the bystanders, all of whom assented to his opinion, except the discriminating Goring, who asserted that it was not the costume which became Lady Mabel, but Lady Mabel who set off the costume, and he carried the popular voice with him. No head looked so well under a Turk's turban as a Christian's, he continued, and no native could show off the national dress here like a genuine English beauty. Lady Mabel had learned to listen complacently to the broadest language of admiration. There were handsome women present, for Elvis could boast its share of beauty, but none to rival hers. The more conspicuous, too, from being loveliness of a different type, and not likely to be overlooked among the dumpy Portuguese ladies, few indeed of whom equaled her in height. Lady Mabel would have been no woman had she not enjoyed the admiration she excited, but she remembered the business of the night, when Goring, bowing to Lil, spoke of the unexpected pleasure of seeing him there. At once interrupting him, she exclaimed, it is probably the last time we shall have the pleasure of meeting our friends of Elvis, so I, at least, have come to devote myself exclusively to them. Do, Colonel Lil, take pity on a dumb woman and lend me a Portuguese tongue. And, gliding off among a party of the natives present, she entered into conversation with them, calling continually on Lil to interlard her complimentary scraps with more copious and better-turned periods. Mrs. Shortridge, too, kept her interpreter, the commissary, close at her elbow, and the quantity of uncurrent Portuguese she made him utter to her guests in the course of the night amounted to a wholesale issue of the counterfeit coin of that tongue. 
From the assiduity of both ladies in courting the natives, one might have thought that they meant to settle at Elvis, or that they were rival candidates canvassing the borough for votes. It was a young and gay party assembled here, and Mrs. Shortridge's floor was soon covered with dancers. In private houses, the national dances are often executed in a modified and less demonstrative style, at least early in the evening than elsewhere. Still, the dancing in Elvis and Badajoz were near neighbors to each other. But a change had come over Mrs. Shortridge, and now she made no protest and saw little impropriety in displays which she had denounced a few days ago. Fashion is the religion of half the world. The mode makes the morals, and what it sanctions cannot be wrong. The commissary, not so easy a convert, sneeringly remarked that the exhibition was very suitable to ballet dancers and such folk, plainly classing most of his guests in that category while Lady Mabel, with bare-faced hypocrisy, glided about among her foreign friends, lamenting that her English clumsiness cut her off from taking her part in a diversion, and in the displays of grace and feeling which, she said, with double meaning, were unbecoming any but women of the Latin races. The night was hot, and dancing made it hotter. So Mrs. Shortridge called upon Lady Mabel to fill up the interval of rest, and gratify the expectations of their friends with some of her choicest songs but yesterday so large an audience would have abashed her. Now she scarcely saw the throng around her in her eagerness to gain her end by prolonging the amusements of the night. She sent Lil for her guitar, made him turn over her music, never releasing him for a moment while she sung no Italian, French, or English songs, but some of those native and cherished requidillas, the airs and words of which find here so ready an access to all hearts and she executed them with a skill, melody, and pathos that flattered and charmed the Portuguese. The guitar, though the cherished friend of serenading lovers of the old Spanish school, was truly but a poor accompaniment to such a voice. But Lil saw that, like the harp, it had the merit of displaying to advantage the roundest, fairest, and most beautifully turned arms he had ever gazed upon. The dancers were again upon the floor. The night sped on, and Lady Mabel made free use of her interpreter in ingratiating herself with the Portuguese. Lil, true to his pledge, taxed his powers to the utmost to be witty and agreeable in her name, at times a little overdoing his part. Thus at supper, when an elaborate compliment to Doña Carlotta Seguiera drew a reply as if it had originated with himself, he stripped it of part of its merit by saying that he was merely the mouthpiece of Lady Mabel's sentiments. When Doña Carlotta expressed her surprise that Lady Mabel's short English sentence should make so long a speech in Portuguese, he explained it by Lady Mabel's peculiar faculty of uttering a volume in three words. Supper and the dance that followed were over. Mrs. Shortridge's great night drew to a close, and many of the company asked for one more melody from the sweet songstress before they dispersed. While turning over her music, Lady Mabel seemed to hesitate in her choice, and Lil thought that her hand trembled as she selected a sheet. As the fruit of his musical gleanings in the peninsula, Major Lumley had lately sent her a parcel of old Spanish songs, among which she had found a little piece, a mere fragment, but exquisitely touching in melody and sentiment. Her father had been much taken with it, but no one else had heard it from her lips like a volatile perfume that escapes in the attempt to pour it from one vessel to another, such things defy translation. How, too, Lady Mabel gave it vocal life may be imagined, not described. She sang it with a truthfulness of feeling that seemed to grow with each succeeding line. For the mere words, we can only find this slender version for the English ear. In joyous hall, now thronged with young and fair, your roving eye marks every beauty here. I harbor not one doubt or jealous fear. Constant your heart, it beats for me alone. In woodland glade, when armed for sylvan war, you mark the antlered monarch from afar. Your sport of toil cannot my pleasure mar. Constant your heart, it beats for me alone. In summer night, gazing on starry sky, and on yon radiant queen who rides on high, your fancy seems to roam, yet hovers nigh. Constant to your heart, it beats for me alone. But hark, yon trump, you start us from a dream. From your bright eyes the warrior flashes gleam. All else forgotten. War is now your theme. Constant, my heart, it beats for you alone. Midst charging hosts the foremost rank is thine. In saddened bower the thrilling fear is mine. You glow with ardor, I in sorrow pine. Constant, my heart, 
it beats for you alone could lil's vanity be beguiling him the tremor of her voice her saddened troubled look the beaming glances of her eyes which hovered about him yet shunned to meet his gaze they all betrayed her she was perhaps half consciously identifying him with the object of the song her audience were delighted but lil was entranced and no longer a responsible man the guests were now fast leaving the house and lady mabel having much to say to mrs shortridge was among the last lil attended her downstairs and was about to hand her into the old coach when she drew back timidly how dark it is with that cloud over the moon i am afraid antonio lobo is scarce postilion enough to drive down that steep rough road without accident lil instantly recollected that having escorted lady mabel to the party it was his privilege to see her safe home again bidding the footman keep the coach door open he sprang into the house for his hat and in a moment was again seated by her side the lumbering vehicle rolled out of the praça and down the sloping street to the western gate of elvis as the guard there closed the gate behind them and shut them out from the light of the lantern they seemed to plunge into outer darkness lady mabel's nervous terrors came back upon her with redoubled violence the fosse under the drawbridge seemed a ravenous abyss and the deep road cut through the glacis and overhung by the outworks appeared to be leading down into the bowels of the earth the road too down into the valley was steep winding and much cut up by use and the heavy winter rains i have been so much on horseback lately she said apologizing for her fears and so seldom in a carriage and this is such a rickety old thing that you must excuse my alarm besides i do not know that antonio ever played the part of postilion before why the coach will run over the mules she exclaimed presently as it glided down a steep spot then springing up and leaning out of the window she called out in plaintive portuguese antonio my good antonio beware of that short turn in the road or we will all go tumbling down the hill together excuse my terrors colonel lil but some late occurrences have shaken my nerves sadly surprised at her unusual timidity lil tried to calm her fears and taking her hand endeavoured to keep it while he assured her that every portuguese peasant was familiar with mules and mountain roads from boyhood with a little laugh she struggling rescued the captured members saying i shall need both my hands to scramble out with when the coach breaks down or overturns whichever happens first and after this she was more chary of her demonstrations of terror to escape his demonstrations of protection if you doubt honest lobo's ability to drive you safe home said lil though i do not perhaps your own man may be more skilful what cut down my two yards of footman into a postilion exclaimed lady mabel on a mule too why he would rebel against such degradation it would be promotion said lil laughing to put a footman into the saddle and william would be of use for once in his life neither i nor nature demand usefulness of him his whole capital consists in being a tall footman who becomes his livery and he fulfils his destiny when both he and it excite the admiration of the alvis ladies the coach presently turned into the olive yard and drew up before the old monastic pile without accident lil was surprised to see the inhabited part of the building brightly lighted up at this late hour old moody looking graver and more sour than ever was at the open door lil handed lady mabel out of the coach and she coolly took his arm showing that he was expected to hand her upstairs before taking leave of her moody followed them into the drawing-room and said abruptly well my lady will you have supper now certainly if it be ready by the by colonel lil i did not see you take the least refreshment at mrs shortridge's not even half a pound of sugar-plums like the portuguese ladies i followed your example for you yourself fasted i was too busy talking my best and my last to my portuguese friends said lady mabel but when and where did you dine dine said lil hesitating then recollecting his luncheon about two o'clock in badajos a spanish dinner i'll warrant at a spaniard's house she exclaimed throwing up her hands you must be faint with hunger why she added taking up a light and holding it close to him you do look pale and famished as if you had dined like a portuguese beggar's brat on a crust rubbed over with a sardinia to give it a flavor i cannot let you go away in this condition if you starve yourself so you will degenerate from a beef-eating red-coat into a rationless spanish soldier there is no danger of that lil answered 
but how do you happen to have a supper ready at this hour? It shows what a slave of habit Moody is. Because he has a supper got for Papa and his friends every night, he could not omit it, though Papa is far away and he knows that I never touch it. But here he comes to announce it. For once it is well timed, and you must do it justice, unless you would make both Moody and myself your enemies for life. Supper is ready, my lady, said Moody, then grumbled aside to her. If you wait a while longer, it will serve for breakfast. Pray send Jenny to me, and then, Moody, I will not keep you up longer, said Lady Mabel, for she was anxious to get rid of the old Marplot. They went into the next room to supper, and she seated Lil sociably beside her. It was truly a tempting little supper party without one too many at table. Lady Mabel had now been long enough in the army to feel at home there. Why should she not, like any of her comrades, bring home a friend to sup with her? especially when that friend is the pleasantest fellow in the brigade. Having, or affecting, an appetite, she set the example to Lil, and urged him to make up for the meagre fare of the day. The table looked as if Lord Strathern and three or four of his friends had been expected to take their seats at it, and when she bid the footman hand wine to Colonel Lil, he promptly placed three decanters on the table. "'William mistakes me for Colonel Bradshaw,' said Lil, smiling as he glanced at them. "'That is Moody's doing,' said she. He provides liberally one bottle for you and two for himself, I suppose. Jenny Aiken now came into the room, very neatly dressed, and evidently not at all surprised at her mistress's summons. Upon this lady Mabel bid William go, as he would not be wanted. I have not a doubt, Colonel Lil, that you prefer a Hebe to a Ganymede. Infinitely, said Lil, and I only wonder how great Jove himself could differ with me. Then let Jenny refill your glass, that you may drink the health of the Portuguese ladies, to whom you said so many witty and pleasant things this evening. I only translated them, said Lil, bowing gaily to her. May I ever be blessed with such an interpreter, said Lady Mabel, and I may, without fear, set up for a wit. And she repeated some of the best things he had said in her name, and seemed to enjoy them so much that Lil, who like some other people had, quote, a heart open as day to melting flattery, end quote, became almost as much charmed with himself as he was with his companion. Thus they amused themselves, recalling the little incidents of the evening, Lady Mabel turning satirist at the cost of all her friends, not sparing even Mrs. Shortridge in her attempts to play the Rome hostess, and ridiculing without mercy the commissary's awkward efforts at Portuguese eloquence and politeness. Then, recalling and laughing at the extravagant compliments paid her after each song, she sung snatches of several of her favorite pieces, but had the grace not to allude to Constant My Heart, while Lil longed for an occasion yet hesitated to tell her how much better he liked it than all the others. In the midst of her extravagantly high spirits checking herself suddenly, she said, I see that you are surprised at me, but not more than I am at myself. Have you ever heard of our Scottish superstition of being fie? that is, possessed by a preternatural excess of vivacity? No. It is deemed the sure forerunner of evil at hand, a sudden and violent death, some dire misfortune, perhaps a sad and final parting of, of the dearest friends. I own, she added with a deep sigh, I cannot free myself from this superstition of the country. I will not share it with you, Lil exclaimed, and you must shake it off. What were life without hope, and high hope, too? And seizing her hand, he kissed it respectfully, but with a fervor which indicated the direction his hopes had taken. For shame, Colonel Lil, she exclaimed, laughing, while she snatched her hand away. See how much shocked Jenny is at this liberty taken with her mistress. Lil had forgotten Jenny Aiken's presence. He turned to look at her, and the Scotch Hebe was plainly more amused than shocked at what she was witnessing. Had Lil forgotten also his appointment tomorrow morning at Alcantara? Perhaps not. But had Sir Roland Hale now appeared and demanded his opinion of the Andalusian levies, Lil would have told him that he had no leisure to think of him or them. But all sublunary pleasure has an end. Supper was over, and Lil could devise no excuse for lingering here but the pleasure of listening to Lady Mabel, who seemed willing to amuse him as long as he stayed. After a pause, divining that he was about to take leave of her, she said suddenly, What an unreasonable fellow Sir Roland Hill must be! Because he cannot find any one to execute his delicate commissions half so well as you do, he must be thrusting them all upon you. 
does he take you for a popish saint endowed with plural presence and able to be in andalusia at badajoz elvis and alcantara all at one time not exactly so said lille a good deal flattered at this speech he has indeed tasked me well at times doing other men's work but it is all in a good cause you know and i never objected to these tasks till now my lord i hear set out for alcantara early this morning taking bradshaw and conway with him yes they rode merrily off this morning said lady mabel in a gay tone a summons to alcantara breaks the monotony of their life here and they were eager to meet sir roland i hear that these conferences with his officers always conclude with a capital dinner that sallow major conway with his fastidious appetite and his calcutta liver will appreciate the excellence of the cuisine i have heard colonel bradshaw dilate with enthusiasm on sir roland's choice selection of wines papa too will meet some new people there which will give him an opportunity of once more undergoing his three years of siege famine and bombardment in gibraltar thirty years ago and of uttering a new addition to the expedition to egypt in which he will again put sir ralph abercrombie to a glorious death in the arms of victory they tell me sir roland too dearly loves these occasions for repeating his favourite lecture on strategy and grand tactics but you must have heard it so often that you can repeat it verbatim to me if you have nothing more entertaining to say i hope i can find topics more agreeable to us both said lille laughing and blushing but unluckily i have in my pocket sir roland's order to meet him there and have intelligence he is waiting for i am afraid he will have to wait i am afraid he will said lady mabel coolly for i do not see how you are to get out of the house now by this time moody has bolted barred and locked every door and window below hidden the keys and gone to bed in his usual condition he never can find them again until his head gets clear in the morning what exclaimed lille that respectable old man drunk every night not every night said lady mabel but have you forgotten in what condition he came back with us from evra true but i thought that an accident and more the effect of sickness than drinking he seemed quite sober when you came home and a graver and more sedate man i do not know oh he is a presbyterian you know and the more liquor he swallows the graver and more sanctimonious he becomes that may be still lady mabel i must find some way of getting out of the house already i shall be too late at alcantara i am afraid sir roland will not drink in your news at breakfast but if it be good it will come in capitally after dinner by way of dessert after dinner said lil hurriedly i must be there many hours before that then i am sorry to have kept you here so long i suppose jenny and i must keep watch by ourselves all night for i cannot keep those heavy-headed fellows awake awake and watching exclaimed lil yes awake and watching lady mabel answered if you could stay we would not insist on your sitting up with us i could have papa's room made ready for you and if i knew that you were asleep in papa's bed with your drawn sword on one side and a pair of his pistols cocked on the other i would not be in the least afraid afraid of what asked lil in astonishment of these robbers who go plundering and murdering all over the country by night said lady mabel her large blue eyes opening wide in well-feigned terror oh don't talk of them my lady said jenny with a stifled scream and an affected shudder have you not heard of them lady mabel asked in a tone of surprise i cannot say i have at least of any depredations here at elvis but we are outside of elvis to our sorrow and the monks great engineers as they have elsewhere proved themselves have constructed but a very weak fortress in this building our garrison is weaker still papa carried off his two most efficient servants william is a simpleton tomkins a craven and moody though bold as a lion is an old man already bound hand and foot and gagged by his strong enemy but where is the portuguese part of your household lil asked being thieves in a small way said lady mabel we always at night lock them out of this part of the building while the robbers were cutting our throats upstairs they might be stealing our silver below we have an anxious time here i assure you it is as much as i can do to keep poor jenny from going off into hysterics she will not go to bed lest she should be robbed and murdered in her sleep it is lucky that i being a soldier's daughter have a little courage courage exclaimed lil i am astonished at your sudden timidity why there is a sentinel day and night here at headquarters 
but out of sight and hearing at the other end of this old rambling monk's roost said lady mabel mounting guard over papa's musty despatches and the fellow now there said jenny told me he could not quit them no not if we were robbed and murdered twice over i could scream now only that i'm afraid the villains might hear me while lil looked suspiciously at the maid not so good an actress as her mistress lady mabel glanced her eye at the clock apparent time called it one real time said it was two hours after midnight she felt sure of her game and need wear the mask no longer she had been acting a long and trying part and began to feel tired and now showed it by letting her terror subside into one or two little yawns which became her so well that lil never thought her more lovely than now when she was getting tired of his company it was high time to get rid of him but now a real fear came over her and she shrunk from his searching glance with unfeigned timidity still the thing had to be done so nerving herself to the task she stepped close up beside him and looking confidingly in his face said i am truly sorry to have kept you here so long and hope you will not find sir roland fretting and fuming at the delay of your news but i was so anxious to have your protection having just learned that these horrid ruffians are not galleros from the spanish band at batajos but some of your own regiment disguised as banditti lil started back one step in an instant from the fairyland of hope and love his eden of delights with every soothing and intoxicating influence around him he found himself transported to a bleak common stripped of his dreamy joys exposed to the ridicule of the enchantress and soon to be pelted with the pitiless jests of all who might hear of his adventure he looked at lady mabel almost expecting to see her undergo some magic transformation but there she stood unchanged except that there was a little sneer on her lip a glance of triumph from her eye an expression of intense but mischievous enjoyment in her whole air and what he had never observed before a strong likeness to her father striving quickly and proudly to recover himself lil said with admirable gravity you have convinced me lady mabel that it is my especial duty to protect you from my own banditti i will not leave you not close an eye in sleep while the shadow of danger hangs over you but he added slowly drawing near to a window and gently opening it i have observed that housebreakers always choose the darkest hours to hide their deeds of darkness for to-night the danger is over the moon is overhead and not a cloud obscures the sky we english may envy these southern nations their nights though not their days half a dozen nightingales were now pouring out their rival melodies in the grove looking out on the landscape before him its features softened rather than concealed by the sober silvery light he repeated how sweet the moonlight sleeps on yonder bank in such a night as this when the sweet wind did gently kiss the trees and they did make no noise in such a night troilus methinks mounted the trojan walls and sighed his soul toward the grecian tents where cressid lay that night while repeating these lines he measured with his eye the distance to the ground the comfort-loving monks had provided lofty ceilings and abundant air for their apartments under the scorching sun of alemtejo but in lil's angry defiant mood he would have leapt from the top of pompey's pillar rather than stay to be laughed at by lady mabel seating himself on the window-sill he turned and threw his legs out of the window for heaven's sake colonel lil what are you dreaming of i am dreaming that happy as ulysses i have listened to the siren and escaped her snares she had sprang forward as he spoke and now threw out her arms to draw him back he eluded her clasp and dropped to the ground on his feet but fell backward and did not at once rise again she shrieked and then called out in a piteous tone speak to me colonel lil for heaven's sake speak say you are not injured not hurt console yourself lady mabel said he rising slowly i have not broken my neck and shall not break my appointment and now i must bid you good-night or shall i say good-morning as lil turned he spied old moody standing in the open gateway of the court with a light in his hand and knitting his shaggy brows he looked neither very drunk nor much afraid of robbers but trembled with rage on seeing lil's mode of breaking out of the mansion with a strong effort of self-control lil walked off without limping and was soon lost in the gloomy shades of the olive and the orange grove lady mabel had played out the comedy and now came reflection what had she done how would it tell 
above all what would lil think of her what were his feelings now and what would they be when the exact truth the whole plot was known to him every faculty hitherto engrossed in the part she was playing until this moment she had never looked on this side of the picture now bitter self-reproach womanly shame and tears vain useless tears filled up the remaining hours of the night jenny aiken's feeble attempts at consolation were worse than futile and she was sent off abruptly to her room for misconstruing the cause of her mistress's grief lady mabel found a little relief in remembering her father's injunction to play her part well and not fail of success she was hardly soothed even by the resolution she took to rate that father soundly for the gross impropriety he had permitted induced nay almost commanded her to perpetrate End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of The Actress in High Life, an episode in Winter Quarters by Sue Pettigrew Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Don Pedro By this light he changes more and more. I think he be angry indeed. Claudio If he be, he knows how to turn his girdle. Benedict Shall I speak a word in your ear? Claudio God bless me from a challenge from much ado about nothing sir roland hale with a stout division had been posted during the winter at coria facing marshal soult in the valley of the tagus holding him to bail not to disturb the peace and quiet of the british army cantoned along the frontier the marshal had now swallowed or pocketed all that he could find in the rich but hapless vale of placentia and of late had been casting hungry glances on the country south of the river this had induced sir roland to ride over from coria to alcantara to look to his line of communication with the southern provinces this old city had been long sinking into decay the french general lapice spent one night in it four years ago and well nigh completed the work which time had begun still its position and famous bridge one arch of which had been blown up and had now been hastily repaired made it an important point at this time in a gothic hall which looked as if it had not long since been visited by the vandals but which had of old been often thronged with members of the once chivalrous order of alcantara now as effete in knighthood as that of malta a military secretary was writing at a small table at the dictation of sir roland hill who stood near perchance as good a knight as ever trod that floor officers came in to him and were sent out again on various missions lord strathern was seated by a larger table at the other end of the room conversing gaily with his fellow travellers from elvis and waiting sir roland's leisure sir roland presently looked at his watch and raising his voice inquired my lord has lil come yet not yet lord strathern answered with a smiling countenance while sir roland's expressed disappointment he knew that the commander-in-chief was about to order a combination of simultaneous movements every part of the allied force from galicia to andalusia had its task allotted and he was anxious to know how far the conde di abispals could be relied on lil is usually before his time said sir roland do you think he got my order yesterday i have little doubt of it said my lord but i doubt his being here soon said bradshaw dipping in his oar to trouble the waters he had to go last night to a concert in elvis a concert detain him i do not understand that nor i sir roland said bradshaw coolly i only heard it without pretending to understand it sir roland looked puzzled but his unfinished dispatch claimed his attention and he turned again to his secretary meanwhile lord strathern was in high spirits the hour has come but not the man he said and began to triumph over conway and laugh at lil so merrily that he would soon have found it in his heart to forgive the latter all his offensive strictures on him but suddenly his merriment gave place to a look of surprise and disappointment conway turning to ascertain the cause saw lil walk into the room as if he had come hither at his leisure yet something in his bearing betrayed that his pride was in arms i am glad to see you lil said sir roland i were loath to disclose my dispatch without adding the intelligence you might bring me by the by some of these gentlemen thought that you would not be here so soon they must have supposed that i had not received your order sir said lil glancing haughtily round on lord strathern but having got it i am here it seems to have cost you hard riding though and more fatigue than you are yet equal to said sir roland remembering his late wounds 
and you have had a fall he added observing some marks on his clothes not from my horse said l isle shortly and somewhat bitterly but it is of no consequence and he hastened to produce his notes and furnish sir roland with the information expected from him besides the unerased marks of a fall l isle's clothes were travel-stained and his face was pale less perhaps from fatigue and loss of sleep than from the violent excitement and revulsion of feelings he had lately undergone but he soon withdrew sir roland's attention from himself to his full and precise account of the state of the andalusian reserve and the garrison of badajoz i am glad to find that this body of spanish troops are not like too many spanish armies men of straw an army on paper said sir roland the french are trying to occupy so extended a position here in estremadura that our andalusian friends may do capital service in harassing their outposts and cutting off their convoys if they can be kept out of the plains and induced not to fight said l isle smiling but the spaniard is always seeking to surround the enemy and force him to battle at all events said sir roland i can now give lord wellington a definite and reliable account of their condition and making a sign to l isle to accompany him he walked across the room and seated himself at the larger table here he held a somewhat prolonged conference with lord strathern in which the other gentlemen were at times called upon to take part when compelled to speak l isle distinguished himself by giving admirable specimens of the lapidary style not one spare word sir roland had many questions to ask and instructions to give but these over he gave a less professional turn to the conversation and then said i hope my lord you and these gentlemen will share my poor dinner to-day but remember i am not at home in alcantara and cannot feast you as you do your friends at elvis neither can we sit long and drink deep as i must return to-night to coria we will dine with you with pleasure said lord strathern pray bradshaw who could have told sir roland that we sit long and drink deep at elvis some thirsty fellow said bradshaw who had drained the last drop from his last bottle oh my lord said sir roland laughing i meant no insinuation but i must finish my despatch and he returned to his secretary while lord strathern and his companions awaited sir roland's leisure l isle sat moodily apart turning an unsocial shoulder toward his lordship giving him a glimpse of his back lord strathern smiled he saw the earth stains and saw moreover evident marks of anger and chagrin in l isle's demeanour his curiosity was strongly excited and he resolved to make the silent man find his tongue pray l isle how came you to let your horse slip from under you and measure your length in the road you are mistaken my lord said l isle formally my horse did not throw me you are so used to success that you will acknowledge no failure not even a fall from your horse or your hobby horse perhaps you got tired and took a nap by the roadside which accounts for your getting here no sooner l isle was too angry to trust himself with an answer but major conway turning to bradshaw said gaily colonel l isle is here soon enough for me he is within the time and i have won the fifty guineas l isle started here was a revelation his last night's adventure was no secret there were more parties to the plot than he had imagined sir said he turning upon conway with a cold hard manner am i to understand that you have done me the honour to bet on my movements here is gratitude for you exclaimed conway pacifically appealing to his companions and his voice attracted sir roland's attention here have i been showing for him the height of friendship hazarding my best friends my guineas on his infallible fulfilment of duty and my full faith in him is received as an outrage i suppose sir said l isle turning on bradshaw with freezing politeness it is you who have so obligingly afforded my volunteer backer so singular an opportunity of proving his friendship i cannot claim the credit of it answered bradshaw with easy urbanity i am not even a stakeholder in the game though as a mere looker-on i confess having watched it with keen and growing interest and with a little wave of the hand he passed l isle gently over to lord strathern l isle looked from the imperturbable colonel to the pacific major who professed to be so zealously his partisan and back again to the former not seeing how he could fasten a quarrel on either he turned somewhat reluctantly on lord strathern who complacently awaited him as for you my lord i might have felt surprised at your making me the subject of such a bet but it is lost in astonishment at the means you took to win it and after all to lose it said lord strathern in a mocking dolorous tone is it not provoking no scruple 
continued Lille, seems to have stood in your way, my lord, in the choice of either means or agent. On the contrary, said Lord Strathern blandly, I always scrupulously choose the best of both. You must have contrived this plot, Lille persisted, though the chief actor be in Elvis, but I will say no more here. A few words more, I pray, said Lord Strathern, smiling. I understood that you were to have been detained in Elvis. How the devil did you get away? Lille turned abruptly away, seeing that the more anger and mortification he showed, the more gratified Lord Strathern seemed to be. Rising from his seat, he walked up to Sir Roland, who had been watching him with much curiosity, and said, I suppose, sir, you have no further use for me here. If so, pray excuse my absence from your table today, as I have occasion to return at once to Elvis. Sir Roland bid his secretary go and send off the despatch at once, then, looking fixedly at Lille, said, I may need you here for a day or two. Lille bit his lip till the blood came, while Sir Roland, stepping over to Lord Strathern, asked in an undertone, What is the matter with Lille, my lord? He seems strangely out of humor. The truth is, Sir Roland, said his lordship in a confidential tone, somebody in Elvis has been quizzing Lille, and a man of his vanity cannot stand being quizzed. Quizzed? said Sir Roland. Does quizzing make a man mad? Lille dared not trust himself longer in Lord Strathern's company. He wanted time to recover his self-command, so he again addressed Sir Roland. That I left Elvis so suddenly and unprepared for a prolonged absence matters little, Sir Roland, but I have been so little with my regiment of late that— Let your major take care of it a few days longer, Sir Roland answered in a positive tone. You had better let Lille go, Sir Roland, said Lord Strathern. He is afraid to lose sight of his regiment, lest they become banditti. Lille's flushed cheek and compressed lips showed that he felt the taunt, while Sir Roland exclaimed in surprise, Are they so unruly? Then you must look to them yourself, my lord, for I shall keep Colonel Lille a while with me. The truth is, Lille, I divine your urgent business at Elvis. Someone there has given you gross offence, and you seek revenge under the name of satisfaction. There is always sin and folly enough in these affairs, but here within sight of the smoke of the enemy's camp, and now when we are about to fall upon them, these personal feuds are criminal madness. I would put you under arrest sooner than let you post off to Elvis on so bloodthirsty an errand. Sir Roland uttered this speech with an air worthy of his Puritan uncle of Calvinistic memory, but in spite of the respect due to the speaker, it was too much for the gravity of his hearers. Lord Strathern and his companions burst into a roar of laughter, and even Lille, amidst all his anger, felt tempted to join them. Gentlemen, said Sir Roland, in grave astonishment, I like a joke as well as any of you. Pray explain this that I may share your enjoyment. Bradshaw, with an effort, cut short his laughter to say, As a neutral party, Sir Roland, I will be Colonel Lille's surety that in whatever mood he may set out for Elvis, as soon as he finds himself in the presence of his enemy there, he will be as gentle as a lamb. You deal in mysteries. Who in Elvis is so safe from Lille's resentment? Nobody but Lady Mabel Stewart. Lady Mabel Stewart, exclaimed Sir Roland, looking at Lord Strathern. If a lady contrived this plot, I shall never unravel it, so you must do it for me. Perhaps the explanation, said Bradshaw, would come more gracefully from my lord. If I knew the details of it, said Lord Strathern, interrupting his hearty laughter, for he seemed resolved at all hazard to recover his fifty guineas in sport out of Lille. I can tell but the beginning, and then, Sir Roland, you can squeeze the rest out of Lille himself. By all means, said Sir Roland. Lille, take a seat and learn to stand fire. You must not dodge from a volley of laughter that happens to be aimed at yourself. Lil reluctantly sat down, while Lord Strathern said, Have you ever discovered, Sir Roland, that Lil is a monomaniac? No. On what point? Discipline. He is a little touched here, said my lord, laying his finger on his temple, on the subject of discipline. He never eats heartily, nor sleeps quietly, but after detecting the breach of a dozen of the rules and regulations made for the government of His Majesty's troops, he fancies that they were made expressly to afford him the pleasure of detecting the breach of them. Is this disease prevalent in your brigade, my lord? Sir Roland inquired in a sarcastic tone. By no means I have kept it down, for my method, looking to the spirit, not the letter of the law, discourages it greatly. 
"'I have seen something of your method, my lord,' said Sir Rowland, smiling, "'but cannot say that I have mastered its peculiar merits.' "'That is very likely,' said Lord Strathern complacently. "'As every art has its mysteries, "'so each man may have some peculiar gift "'in the application of his art. "'Even though taught by the same master, "'no two men's handwriting are exactly alike, "'so each of us may have some inimitable peculiarity "'in his soldiership. "'It is certain that Lil, "'not understanding my more enlarged and liberal system, "'wished to force me into his own narrow notions, "'and when I would not yield to him, "'he intimated to me that I was training up banditti.' I had to recommend to him the study of one of the articles of war which he had overlooked. It treats of subordination and of each man's minding his own business. Neither of us was very successful in keeping his temper, and indeed being a good deal ruffled, I afterwards spoke pretty freely of Lille's conduct to these gentlemen who dined with me. Mabel shared my feelings, and with my consent set a trap for him, hoping to teach him that he himself might be caught tripping. How he escaped in time to get here you must learn from himself. Come, Lil, we have heard the prologue, said Sir Roland. Be not bashful, but give us the comedy. What was Lil to do? It was evidently something more than curiosity that made Sir Roland so earnest to sip this matter. He could hardly refuse all explanation to him, and he felt that it would never do to give an account of Lady Mabel's behavior to himself as he had construed it. Lord Strathern, too, did not exactly know what he was urging him to do. Suddenly, recollecting Lady Mabel's note, Lil drew it from his pocket and handed it to her father for his private reading. To Lil's astonishment, Lord Strathern read it out with great gusto and commented on it. This was capital bait for the trap. And pray, Mr. Interpreter, how did you and your principal get through the evening? You see the dilemma, Sir Roland, exclaimed Bradshaw with glee. Here was a conflict of duties. Colonel Lill had to obey two commanders at one time, which scripture tells us is difficult, if not impossible. Lill seems to have achieved the impossible, said Sir Roland, for I know you are too gallant a man, Lill, to neglect a lady's order for mine. Sir Roland's manner, though not his words, were urgent for an explanation, and Lill, being now fairly in for it with an effort, gathered his wits together and opened the narrative of his last night's adventure. He recounted Lady Mabel's successful efforts to amuse and occupy him into a forgetfulness of the flying hours, her artful delays before setting out, their slow but pleasant drive uphill to Elvis, the animated and well-sustained part she had played throughout the evening, her wit, her satire, and her singing, and his labors as interpreter acknowledging many foolish things of his own in his efforts to be witty and amusing according to contract. He described her well-feigned fear of returning home in the dark without an escort, the brilliantly lighted house and well-timed supper, at which, unconscious of the flight of time, he sat listening to her diverting talk, including her piquant sketch of Sir Roland's glorious dinners and tactical lectures, and the value his officers set on each. Here his auditors had each an opportunity of laughing at each other and being laughed at in turn. Lil strove to make Lady Mabel appear witty, amusing, and adroit. He gave edge to her satire, keenness to her wit but carefully rounded off all the more salient points of her acting. He said nothing of her singing, constant my heart at him. He did not hint at his taking her hand in the coach or kissing it at the supper-table, but dilated on her skillful libel on old Moody's sobriety and her well-acted dread of the house-breaking banditti, from whom he could best protect her, as they are no other than his own men. Though Lille did not get through his narrative with the best possible grace, he was doubly successful in it at once greatly amusing his auditors, yet exhibiting Lady Mabel only as a witty girl, who had merely played the part allotted to her with mischievous pleasure and consummate tact. But he attained this at the cost of showing himself an easy dupe to her arts and getting well laughed at for his pains. It cost Lil no small effort to do this. It was, in fact, a heroic self-sacrificing act for he was not used to being laughed at, and there is something highly amusing in compelling a man to tell a story which makes him more and more ridiculous at every turn. But while showing so much consideration for Lady Mabel, so far was he from beginning to forgive her ill usage of him, that the constraint he had put upon himself only embittered his feelings towards her. As to Lord Strathern, he was delighted with the account of Mabel's cunning maneuvers and witty speeches, even to the point of laughing heartily at her satire on himself and he reveled in Lil's ill-concealed mortification, exclaiming, 
what a pity the plot failed by mabel's unmasking too soon that and your good horse enabled you to keep your appointment at the risk of your neck why lil you might have become a ballad hero mabel would have put your adventure in verse and set it to music and you would have been sung by all our musical folks from major lumley down to the smallest drummer boy you are a lucky fellow but this time your luck has lost you fame and how did you get away at last asked sir roland fully convinced that lil had been a prisoner under lock bolt and bar the earth stains on lil's clothes might have testified that he had gotten a bad fall in jumping out of a lady's window at two o'clock in the morning but this is a scandalous world lil remembered bradshaw without looking at him and evaded the question i found old moody lantern in hand at the open gate looking as if he had drank nothing but vinegar in a month the picture of sour sobriety sir roland had striven in vain not to join in the laugh but in spite of himself was much diverted at lil's adventure but he was provoked at the usage his favorite colonel had incurred for the best of faults too much zeal for the service and he longed to discuss with lord strathern the propriety of setting traps for his own officers when posting with important intelligence to their common commander but there was a lady in the case and sir roland was afraid to broach the subject lord strathern too though his subordinate was nearly old enough for his father a man of high rank and a known good soldier so he put off the discussion to a more convenient season as to lil sir roland had been watching him closely and saw something in his eye and bearing that betrayed too much exasperation for him to be trusted to return at once to elvis so sir roland invented on the spot a special duty for him and bid him accompany him that evening to coria chapter nineteen chapter twenty and the conclusion of the actress in high life an episode in winter quarters by sue pettigrew bowen this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty ralph help down with the hangings roger by and by ralph i am making up the trunks here ralph who looks to my lady's wardrobe humphrey down with the boxes in the gallery and bring away the couch cushions short hose will it not rain no conjuring abroad nor no devices to stop this journey from wit without money away you trifler love i love thee not i care not for thee kate this is no world to play with mammoths and to tilt with lips we must have bloody noses and cracked crowns and pass them current too god's me my horse from henry the fourth lord strathern returned the next day to elvis and found his daughter very desolate and full of more than filial anxiety to see him she was alone for the commissary had the day before sent off his heavy baggage toward lisbon lady mabel would at any time have grieved at parting with a true-hearted friend like mrs shortridge but now other troubles weighed heavy on her and so aggravated her obvious grief while the chief cause was hidden that her kind friend was deeply moved and greatly flattered at perceiving it had she stayed longer in elvis lady mabel would have confided her troubles to her knowing that though she might not think wisely she could feel rightly and give both advice and sympathy but after a struggle of hesitation she let mrs shortridge depart in ignorance receiving from her many kind messages and adieus for lil perhaps it was best that it should be so for had the good lady learned the usage her favorite had met with she might for once in her life have boiled over with indignation well ma belle said lord strathern as soon as he was alone with his daughter so that fellow lil beat us after all at our own game i did expect that your woman's wit would have carried it through successfully would to heavens papa my woman's wit as you call it had been sufficient to keep me out of it altogether how could you think of putting such a part upon me i never would have dreamed of it if you had not urged insisted on my detaining him here what is colonel lil to me that i should manoeuvre to keep him in elvis when sir roland expects him in alcantara and as for my resenting your quarrels with him there is an impropriety in it and yet more in the mode you made me adopt i am ashamed of myself i am ashamed of you papa for conceiving it and to fail after all said lord strathern and yet by lil's own account you played your part well his account exclaimed lady mabel to whom to us all sir roland bradshaw conway and myself 
He was disposed to be sulky and silent at first, but with Sir Rowland's help we drew it all out of him. Drew it all out of him, said Lady Mabel in a faltering tone. She gasped for breath and her cheeks grew pale. For the next moment the blood rushed into her face and she exclaimed, What? Did Colonel Lill give you a full account of the party, of all that occurred that evening? Full and minute. He was very reluctant to tell as we were all laughing at him. But Sir Rowland is a good inquisitor and made him speak out and at length. I did not know he had so good a memory or you so much wit. For heaven's sake, Papa, what did he tell you? Lady Mabel sat watching her father with eager eyes, her hands firmly clasped, and her heel impatiently tapping the floor, while she strove to master her almost uncontrollable confusion and anxiety. Why, he handed me your note, said Lord Strathern. Perhaps he meant it for my eye alone, but it was such capital bait for the trap that I read it aloud. He then seemed to make up his mind to conceal nothing. He told us of your artful delays, your slow-paced coach crawling uphill, of your efforts to entertain Mrs. Shortridge's company and keep him employed as interpreter, your songs and your care to prolong the amusements of the evening, your affected fears at riding home in your old coach with your new postillion. He described your supper party and repeated your entertaining conversation, your libel on Moody, gone drunk to bed, and your satire on Sir Roland and the rest of us your well-acted terror of robbers, and your triumph over him when you thought the game was won. If you had not been overconfident and too hasty, Mabel, we could have had Lil on the hip. Was that all he told you? asked Lady Mabel. Why, was there anything more to tell? inquired her father. Lady Mabel drew a deep, long breath. Then he said nothing about my, my singing constant my heart to him. How? exclaimed lord strathern did you sing constant my heart at him how could i help it papa it came in so pat to the purpose the devil it did it seems you did not mean to fail by underacting your part it is lucky he forgot to mention it was there anything more and he said nothing about squeezing my hand in the coach asked she hesitatingly when i showed so much fear of its overturning squeezing your hand or of his kissing it after supper. What, had he got on so far? And pray, madam, what did you tell him? Tell him, said Lady Mabel, I was acting a part, you know, papa, so I told him his presumption had put Jenny Aiken quite out of countenance. By Jove, you were acting your part with a vengeance. Why not tell him at once never to kiss your hand when a third person was present? How can you talk so, papa? I meant no such thing. "'But what account did he give you of his leaving the house?' "'Merely that he hurried away when you unmasked the plot to him, "'hastened to Elvis to get his horse and post off to Alcantara. "'Then he said nothing of his leaping out of the window. "'Did he leap out of the window? "'Or of my trying to hold him back? "'What?' exclaimed Lord Strathern, starting up. "'Did he escape by jumping out of the window "'and you try to detain him? "'The height was so great I feared he would break his neck.' "'Damn his neck,' said Lord Strathern, striding up and down the room. "'Better a neck cracked than a reputation. "'Things have come to a pretty pass. "'You singing love songs at him, "'he squeezing and kissing your hand, perhaps going further. "'In these cases women never tell the whole truth. "'When he would escape by a leap from your window, "'you try to keep him by strength of arm. "'You get on finely, madam. Three months in the army have done wonders for you.' Three months more will accomplish you so thoroughly that you will be fit for no other society through life. I will tell you what, Mabel, I will not lose a moment but bundle you up and pack you off to your aunt while you are yet worth sending. Between shame and indignation at this unjust assault from such a quarter, poor Lady Mabel burst into tears and rushed off to her room, where she looked herself up, resolving never again to leave it until she commenced her journey homeward. It was not long before her hasty father repented of his coarse and violent attack on her, in a case in which the heaviest fault was his own. He came rapping at her door, and by dint of apologies, remonstrance, and commands, brought her out, and induced her to spend the evening in his company. And a very uncomfortable evening it was to both of them. Two days after this, Lil rode into Elvis, and brought orders with him that set the town astir. 
such a breaking up of all the comfortable and luxurious arrangements of messes and quarters had not been lately seen for elvis was the capua of the brigade which had to lighten itself of many an encumbrance including much of what shortridge termed its heavy baggage in order to bring itself to a condition to march there was many a woeful parting too and scandal says that the ladies of elvis might have laid the dust with their tears but we will leave these stories to colonel bradshaw all was confusion in the household at headquarters lord strathern had to bestir himself to get both his brigade and himself ready to march by one route and lady mabel had to prepare for her journey by another it was now that moody's worth shone manifestly forth the old coach and harness were overhauled and put in order he secured we believe by impressment another pair of mules and two postilions every leaf of the hortus sigus was carefully packed and put into the hands of an arriero bound for lisbon and jenny aiken and william the footman were pulled and shoved about in a way that convinced them that it was time to be moving yet he found plenty of time to spur up my lord's own servants and push forward their preparations busy as lord strathern was he failed not to remark moody's prompt methodical and energetic labors he pronounced him the prince of quartermasters and a heavy loss to the army the old fellow would evacuate a fortress or conduct a retreat with the precision of a parade and not leave even a dropped cartridge to the enemy behind him in fact had marshal soult sworn to sack elvis to-morrow moody could not have been more on the alert in getting lady mabel ready to leave it not that he was afraid of a frenchman he would willingly have faced him and made his mark upon him but when all might be lost and nothing gained by staying moody like xenophon was proving his soldiership by a speedy yet orderly retreat he was carrying off lady mabel via the villages of lisbon and london to his stronghold of craggy side where he trusted she would be safe from lill and popery many signs of a speedy flitting were now seen about headquarters lady mabel sat melancholy and alone in her half dismantled drawing-room to-morrow she is again to enter the desert of alemtejo on her way back to lisbon what a relief she would have found in busy preparations even for that dull journey now robbed of all the charms of novelty and expectation but moody's industrious alacrity had deprived her even of this resource she was ready and instead of busy preparations had only sad thoughts to occupy her about to part with that father of whom she had known more in the last three months than in all her life before for hitherto hers had been but a child's knowledge of him loving him and proud of him for the defects she began to see she viewed but as minor blemishes foreign to his nature and due solely to that long career in which he had known no home nor companionship but what he found in garrison and field she could not conceal from herself the new career of danger she was about to run everything she heard indicated that he was now to march to fields where war's wild work would be urged on with a fury and on a scale for which the last five campaigns great as their results had been were but the preparation she shuddered to think that yet a few days or weeks and the veteran of near forty years of service may lie on his last field this perhaps was not her greatest grief but she strove to make it so and sat gloomily and anxiously awaiting her father's return from elvis presently she heard the sound of horses hoofs clattering on the pavement of the court rising from her melancholy posture she was going to meet her father when on opening the door colonel lill stood before her all the incidents of the last evening they had spent together particularly those which she had so carefully suppressed from the narrative wrung from him rushed upon her memory her folly and his generous forbearance stood facing each other casting her eyes on the floor and grasping the handle of the door to steady her tottering frame she could only gasp out i expected my father my lord is very busy in elvis and so indeed was i said lil coolly but as i march at sunrise to-morrow i felt bound to borrow a few minutes from duty to take my leave of lady mabel stuart she now recollected herself enough to let go the handle of the door and make room for him to enter and by a motion of the hand invited him to take a seat taking a chair near her lil ran his eye round the well-remembered room perhaps he was thinking of his last visit here perhaps remarking his dismantled comfortless condition it was not more changed than he was all his earnest frankness of manner was gone he seemed to have borrowed a leaf from colonel bradshaw's book and his air of cool self-possession his imperturbable manner under the present trying circumstances would have excited that gentleman's admiration but it added a chill to the discomfort of lady mabel's position 
Had he been angry, indignant, haughty, or sullen, it would have been an infinite relief to her. She might have known how to deal with him, and perchance have soon brought him round to a very different mood. Now Lille evidently waited with cool politeness to hear some sound from her lips, and she at length stammered out, "'I am very sorry that you are going, that is, that Papa and all of you are going so soon.' "'Our pleasant sojourn in Elvis is over,' said Lil carelessly, "'and Elvis is a pleasant place. "'Your stay here, too, has been quite an episode in winter quarters. "'We cannot thank you too much for the enlivening influence of your presence among us. "'I, for one, will ever carry with me a vivid recollection of it.' "'Lady Mabel bowed. "'How cold and formal did this sound in her ears! "'To do ourselves justice,' continued Lil, some of us have not been remiss in our efforts to enable you to pass your time pleasantly. I dare say now, were I to hold myself to a strict account, I could reckon up many an hour stolen from the dull routine of duty to devote it to Lady Mabel's service. I am surely deeply indebted to you for the hours you so borrowed to bestow on me, Lady Mabel answered, much at a loss what to say, and looking every way but at Lil. When I look back, I cannot but be surprised at the amount of my gains, the knowledge and amusement I have crowded into three short months, and chiefly through you. That time has passed, however, said Lil. I can no longer be at hand to afford you amusement. And as for knowledge, although older than you, and knowing more of life, the world, and perchance of books, I doubt whether you have been the greatest gainer in our intercourse. But feeling a deep interest in you, I sincerely hope that you may gain one precious lesson through me. "'What is that?' asked Lady Mabel eagerly, for the first time looking fully at him. "'Never again, heartlessly, to throw away a friend,' Lil said this more gravely than bitterly. Then rising, he bowed respectfully but formally and was turning to go away. "'Can she let him go without one word? But what can she say?' She at length gasped out, "'It was Papa's doing.' "'Your father's doing?' exclaimed Lil with well-feigned astonishment. Then Lady Mabel is an automaton, he added scornfully, and I, blockhead that I am, never found it out till now. But I am thankful for wisdom even that comes too late. I now know Lady Mabel and myself. Was not Lady Mabel now disarmed and defenseless? Completely at his mercy? By no means. In this extremity she sheltered herself behind her strongest defences. She covered her face with her hands and burst into tears. Was ever man more embarrassed than Lil? His proud, scornful air vanished like a snowflake in the fire, and forgetting all that had passed, he was seizing her hands to draw them away from her face when old Moody abruptly entered the room and called out, "'Colonel Lil, you are wanted in Elvis.' "'What the devil are you doing here?' said Lil, turning around quickly and placing himself so as to hide Lady Mabel's face. "'My duty,' said the old man sternly, "'and they have sent for you to attend to yours.' For he saw that something had gone wrong, and he longed to get Lil out of the house. Looking into the passage, Lil now saw an orderly whom Moody had officiously brought upstairs from the door, and he hurried out to receive the man's message and send him off. This done, he hastily re-entered the room to speak to Lady Mabel but he was too late. The bird had flown, and her old Scotch terrier was covering her retreat, shutting the door of the next room behind her and spitefully locking it in Lil's face. At sunrise the next morning, Lil marched his regiment out of Elvis. Setting his face sternly northward, he never once looked back on the serried ranks which followed him until the embattled heights of La Lippa had hidden Elvis and its surroundings. Turning his back upon the past, he strove to look but to the future. But at the very moment of this resolve, memory cheated him, and he caught himself repeating a line of Lady Mabel's song. All else is forgotten. War is now my theme. And the thrilling music of her intonation seemed to swell upon his ear. He hastily exchanged his quotation for a greater poet's words. He that is truly dedicate to war hath no self-love. If it be possible to forget, he will have ample opportunity, amidst the crash of armies and the crumbling of an empire, to erase from his memory Elvis and its episode in winter quarters. From the heights of Trazos Montes, Wellington was now to make an eagle swoop upon the north of Spain and a lion's spring upon the herd driven into the basin of Vittoria. 
The march now begun was to lead thence to the blood-stained passes of the Pyrenees, to Bayonne, Orthez, and Toulouse, and later to Paris, from the field of Waterloo. But who shall measure, step by step, over conquered enemies and fallen friends, this long, eventful road? To die beneath the hoofs of trampling steeds, that is the lot of heroes upon earth. CONCLUSION He that commends me to mine own content, commends me to the thing I cannot get. I to the world am like a drop of water, that in the ocean seeks another drop, who falling there to find his fellow forth, unseen, inquisitive, confounds himself. From Comedy of Errors Three eventful years have passed, and a general peace is giving rest to exhausted Europe. The war has cut off many a brave man, but it remained for peace to terminate the military career of a rising soldier in Lille's person, and, as sad to say, before he was either major general or knight of the bath, though sought in many a dangerous path, he had not found his golden spurs. Regiments have been disbanded, his comrades are scattered, and he himself has nothing to do, not even the poor resource of having to study economy on half-pay, or of looking for more additional means to eke out a living. It is the course of those entirely engrossing pursuits which excite all our enthusiasm and task every energy, and of which the statesman's and the soldier's callings are the best examples, that when they fail us we can find no substitute. All things else are, by comparison, stale, flat, and unprofitable. Can the brandy-drinker cheer himself with draughts of small beer? Screw up his nervous energies to their accustomed tone with slops. Tired to death of fox-hunting, pleasant shooting, and country neighbors, all the means of excitement around him exhausted, Lil lounged in the library at C. Blank D. Hall, with half a dozen open but discarded volumes before him, revolving in his mind all possible means of occupation. At one time he would resolve to travel the world over, and get up a personal narrative, attractive as that of Humboldt, and views of nature, that should look through nature's surface to the recognition of nature's God, whom the philosopher seems never to have found in all his works. At another time, in order more effectively to counteract the ill effects, on mind and habits, of the soldier's exciting and unsettled life, he resolves to subject himself to still severer regimen, not to go rambling about the world an idling philosopher, but to tie himself down to one spot, and take violently to a course of high farming, grow the largest turnips, breed the fattest south downs and the heaviest devonshires, and carry off agricultural prizes as substitutes for additional Waterloo medals. But this was too severe a contrast to his late mode of life, and the prospect soon disgusted him utterly. Having strong influence to back him, he now thought of getting a seat in Parliament, and, for a moment, the prophetic cries of "Hear, hear!" arose from both sides of a full house of commons. But he knew that the occasion, even more than the man, makes the orator, and in this weak piping time of peace, these cost-counting, debt-paying days, he foresaw no occasion that could call forth the thunders of Demosthenes or Burke. But although a new light shines in upon him, and he suddenly makes up his mind that, since he can no longer take the field, because all the world is tired of fighting, and yet more of paying the bills run up in that expensive diversion, he will write the narrative of the campaigns in which he had taken part, without letting the quorum pars magna fui fill too large a place in the picture. Where can he find so much of the materials needed in the construction of his work as in London? So to London he went. The season was at its height, and the town was full. Lille's object required that he should not only examine many musty papers, but see many persons, as some of his gayer friends soon found him out and induced him to look in upon the inner circles of London fashionable life, to which his early and long absence from England had kept him a stranger. It so happened that Lord Strathern had come up from his moors where the winter had got too cold for him. The climate had changed much since he was a boy, to visit the clubs and meet old comrades but these proved too much for the old veteran, who soon had to shut himself up in order to stave off an attack of his old enemy, the gout. He would not, however, permit Lady Mabel to stand the siege with him. The consequence was that not long after Lil had come up to London, he found himself in one of Lady D. Blank's thronged rooms within four steps of Lady Mabel. In three years she had become, if we may be pardoned the bull, more like herself than ever, for she was now all that she had promised to be. She shone out in a richer and riper beauty, and a more sedate and womanly deportment set it off, retaining not the least trace of that somewhat cavalier manner she had picked up in the brigade. 
she was more than three years wiser, and certainly more dangerous than ever. Lil had long and studiously schooled himself to the conviction that his fair and fascinating companion in Elvis was, after all, but a heartless woman. Yet his vanity, to say nothing of any other feeling, had never quite gotten over the rude shock it had received on Mrs. Shortridge's great night there. His first thought was to withdraw from the dangerous neighborhood. But he blushed at his own cowardice, and the moment after, having caught her eye, he, self-confident, made his way through the crowd and greeted her politely as an old acquaintance. It was plain that she was a little nervous on his approach. Her lips were compressed for a moment, and she drew more than one deep breath, while watching him closely and carefully modeling her manner by his. Yet no stranger could have inferred, from word or look, that they had not met for years, still less that they had ever met on terms of intimacy. If Lil needlessly prolonged the conversation to the annoyance of the gentleman at her elbow, his sole object was to prove to her, beyond the possibility of doubt, by his easy self-possession, that he had now, at least, attained a sublime indifference where she was concerned. The ice once broken, accidents seemed to throw them frequently into the same company. Lil doubtless needed relaxation from his historical labors, and a London season had at least the attraction of novelty for him. He was, too, just the man to win friends among the ladies, yet he still made it a point, whenever he met Lady Mabel, to bestow on her a few minutes' cold attention and indifferent notice, for old acquaintance' sake. Lady Mabel stood in no need of these attentions. It was not her first season, and many a butterfly that hovered about that garden which blooms in winter at the West End had hailed with delight the reappearance of this rare flower. And she liked to have them buzzing about her. It was her due, and yielded pleasant pastime. Yet, while busiest dealing sentiment, jest, and repartee among them, she now had always an ear and a word for Lil, when he condescended to bestow a few minutes' cold consideration on her. Her gentleman-in-waiting wondered at her having so much to say to Lil. She seemed to be under an obligation to be at leisure for him, and Sir Charles Morton, who was argus-eyed where Lady Mabel was concerned, ventured to ask, "'What pleasure can you find in talking to this austere soldier? His smile is a sneer. He warms only to grow caustic, and his cynical air betrays how little he cares even for you.' "'Were you ever clogged with sweet things?' asked Lady Mabel. At times I tire of bonbons and long for vinegar, salt, and pepper. My austere friend deals in these articles. She seemed to have found a special use for him, treating him as a complete thinking machine of high powers of observation, inflection, thought, and reason, but not susceptible of aught that savored of feeling, sentiment, or passion. She quietly threw the mantle of mentor over his shoulders, deferred to his judgment, had recourse to him as a storehouse of knowledge and seemed so fully impressed with the fact that he had a head as utterly to forget the probability of his having a heart. With a strange perversity, Lil was at once flattered and annoyed at the use she made of him. It was an unequal game he was playing, like a moth fluttering round a candle. His temper began to be worn threadbare, and oftener than ever he repeated to himself, She is a heartless woman. In this mood, Lil was listening with a curled lip to an animated discussion between Lady Mabel, Sir Charles Morton, and another gentleman, as to the merits of a new actress, a dramatic meteor, then briefly eminent on the London boards. The Honourable Mr. L. Blank, who was a savant in the small sciences that cater to amusement, pronounced her the Siddons of the day. Lady Mabel called her a ranter then, as if alarmed at her temerity, appealed as usual to Lil. No one can be a better judge of acting than Lady Mabel, said Lil. But for her opinion, I would call your favorite an indifferently good actress. Thus to damn with faint praise, displease Mr. L. Blank, more than positive censure, and he exclaimed, Then you never saw her play Jane Shore. The illusion is perfect. The house is deceived into forgetting the drama, to witness the living and dying agonies of the desolate penitent. Who can equal her? Many, answered Lil, and Lady Mabel can do better. Lady Mabel? She doubtless excels in everything, but I never saw her act. I have, said Lil bitterly. The illusion of Mrs. Blank's acting is limited to the spectators. Lady Mabel deceives him who acts with her. Lady Mabel turned pale and then read, while the two gentlemen stared at her and Lil alternately. Suddenly exclaiming, there is my friend Mrs. B. Blank. I have not seen her for a month. I must go and speak to her. She accepted the arm of the savant in small things and hastened after her friend who had appeared so opportunely. 
you set little value on lady mabel's favors said sir charles looking inquisitively at lil you have certainly offended her greatly do you think so said lil coldly then i suppose i must apologize and beg my peace if you do it successfully said his companion i will be glad of a lesson from you in the art lil was angry with himself not that he felt that he owed lady mabel any amends but he had never until now made the slightest allusion to certain scenes in the past pride had forbidden it and he was still reproaching himself with his want of self-control when on entering another room he saw lady mabel seated between two old ladies having ensconced herself there to get rid of the small savant she no longer looked discomposed or angry nor did she turn her eyes away on his approach she almost seemed to wish to speak to him so he offered his arm and they walked toward the room he had just left i know that you are too proud she said to ask my pardon for the attack you made on me just now so i wish to tell you that i have already forgiven it that is truly generous said lil with haughty irony you prove the adage false which says the injurer never forgives say you so i see then that you have gone back years to dig up old offences although i remember to repent of them i trusted that you would have willingly forgiven and forgot my folly or only recall it to laugh at it i know now she said stealing a look at him that you are of an unforgetting unforgiving temper then looking away she added i thought better of you once there are some things answered lil but in a softened tone not to be forgotten nor easily forgiven i assure you said lady mabel with the air of a penitent i have been terribly ashamed of myself ever since had i known that you still viewed my thoughtless conduct as a serious wrong to you i would willingly have made you any apology any reparation apologies would hardly reach the evil said lil but any reparation that is a broad term any i mean that you ought to ask or i to make there would be no absolute impropriety in my asking a good deal said lil in tones that reminded lady mabel of some witching moments in elvis i will not make the blunder of asking too little he added resolutely let me first ask when you will be at home to-morrow at three certainly at three more certainly at two she answered in a low tone and most certainly at one said he joyously i like your superlative degree of comparison i only meant she said yet more confused that i am more likely to be at home alone at two and turning quickly away she took a vacant seat beside one of her friends to whom while fanning herself she complained of the heated room she seemed indeed quite overcome by it which accounted for her laboured breathing and heightened colour after all said lady mabel some days after the morning on which lil found her at home alone i was neither so good an actress nor so great a hypocrite as you took me for my offence was not so much that i stimulated as that i ceased to dissemble lil readily embraced the faith that she was no actress but a true woman nor did he ever waver from it but she did not always find so easy a convert old moody true to his nature baffled all her efforts to convince him of his errors it is true that he became in time somewhat reconciled to lil but to his dying day he continued to loud that special providence which had snatched lady mabel from the land of idolatry at the very last moment before her perversion to rome lady mabel was not the woman to forget old friends and now that she could recur with pleasure to her recollections of elvis she sought out that companion who had so amiably filled the part of duenna and chaperon she and mrs shortridge fought all their battles over again by retracing step by step varied excursions and toilsome journey while enjoying all the comforts of an english home but it never does to tell all that we do still less to lay open the spirit in which we do it lady mabel never let mrs shortridge fully into the secret history of the last dark treacherous scene in the episode in winter quarters lord strathern was much pleased to find that lil had greatly modified his opinion as to the mechanical nature of an army and hoped in time to dispel certain other erroneous notions to which he had formerly clung so stubbornly it is not known whether or not lil ever finished his narrative of the peninsular campaigns it is certain that he never published it the author often labours harder than the ploughman and when a man is made happy he becomes lazy let the wretched toil to mend his lot or to forget it 
End of chapter 20 and the conclusion. End of the actress in high life, an episode in winter quarters by Sue Pettigrew Bowen. Recorded by Celine Major.